So if I might turn very briefly to what we say are also what appear to be four constitutional principles, which, as I think uh, His Lordship Mr. Justice Collipin suggested in the introductory remarks, we perhaps have all in fact now agreed upon. But it is important to underline the agreement because it then frames the debate. Yeah. The first is that the fundamental constitutional scheme by which the country's laws are to be made is set by the constitution and the constitutional court has reiterated that. It provides the framework by which the DMA must be interpreted. We all accept that now. Secondly, the constitution disciplines the exercise of executive power and it tells us, and the constitutional court has reiterated this in numbers of cases, which I shall take us to briefly, that it tells us when correlative legislative duties are triggered. So the constitution disciplines exercises of power and at the same time tells us when duties are triggered in respect of those powers. And in this case, we say that it does so through the lens, obviously, of Section 7.2 of the Constitution, as read with the separation of powers doctrine. And we say that, in this case, Parliament's power to pass laws has to be discharged, not just because it's the engine house of our democracy, as Justice Sachs has put it, but because of its correlative duty as the lawmaker that is then fundamentally entrusted, to use the words of the Supreme Court of Appeal in the King case, it is entrusted to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill our rights through the passing of legislation. That's how it discharges that, discharges that duty. The third constitutional anchor is that the Constitution tells us why Parliament should be doing so. The Constitution tells us that there are very important process and substance features that the Constitution holds dear when it says that Parliament is entrusted as the lawmaker. And we will look at those, as I say, as my first uh, chapter in a moment. The fourth point, again, by way of constitutional anchor, is that the Constitution tells us when and how a court is permitted to intervene. The government contends in this case that it's not appropriate for your lordships to interfere with its work. But we say with respect, of course, that's not so. Separation of powers disputes are often resolved by the courts. The Constitutional Court itself has recognized that separation of powers is an imp implied provision of our Constitution, and it is confirmed that such implied provisions are no less justiciable than express provisions. And in our heads of argument, we've referenced the Heath case, and we've referenced that for the benefit of the court, if you uh, wish to make a note in our heads at paragraph 125, we've referenced the Heath case by the Constitutional Court, and there the court made it express at its paragraph 25, it said the national and provincial executives prepare and initiate laws to be placed before the legislatures. They implement the laws thus made, but have no lawmaking power other than that vested in them by the legislatures. And then said the court, under our constitution, it's the duty of the courts to ensure that the limits to the exercise of public power are not transgressed. So we say with respect, and we'll come back to that in uh, obviously a little bit more detail when we talk about remedy, but right at the outset, I think we can all accept that the court is empowered to scrutinize separation of powers issues. And this case is a separation of powers case. It really is about where powers should mm -hmm. properly now be exercised uh, in this country in response to this pandemic. Thank so, you. Sorry, Mr. Dupsi. Could I, could I just ask you, if, if indeed the question of the efficacy of the response and secondly, the question of the legal and constitutional coherence of the content of the response. In other words, what is in the regulations are really not before this court and are not being challenged in a serious way. Then is this case about whether the locus of that response is what the court is confronted with? And that if parliament as the primary lawmaker offers, as it were, almost the same response that wouldn't be a problem, provided that it was done by Parliament as opposed to the executive. Is that the crux of, the, of your argument? Well, it's perhaps slightly richer than that, with respect. It is absolutely correct, as your Lordship points out, that the debate between us all is about locus. Where is this power of lawmaking to be exercised? No question in that respect, uh, and we agree with your Lordship. But it's not just that if Parliament were able to issue exactly the same response that we would be happy. 
because of course we don't know what parliament's response would be firstly so we do wish obviously to have parliament go through the process of taking control and then exercising its lawmaking powers because it has to do an effective job as lawmaker but also because there are inherent constitutional goods that come from it doing so rather than from the executive being entitled to do so uh, it's a bit if i might put it it's a bit like the no difference principle it's 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 no good to say well it makes no difference if uh, this had simply been redone because the same outcome would have been achieved we don't know we simply don't know whether if parliament had done its duty as we say it ought to have as the lawmaker whether it would have passed the same laws different laws or better laws but what we do know is that the constitutional court has stressed that through that process we can be absolutely assured of very significant con uh, constitutional advantages that come from the process which I'll take your lordships to in a second but also that there would then be the potential for a more effective response and a more effective response in numbers of ways which again uh, I will come to in a second um, so to answer your question yes it is about locus but it's not just about locus it's about locus for a reason for the constitutional reasons that we hope to have fulfilled and that the constitutional court has stressed are absolutely critical to understanding why it is the legislature in our democracy which is the engine house for lawmaking. Uh, so, Mr. De Blissy, just to ride on to that question that Judge Colapin asked, um, and, um, and I'm taking you back to the framing issues that you mentioned earlier. Um, yes, the question is about locus. Where is this legislative power located? But in your framing of the issues, in the first one, you say there's no challenge by the applicants on the regulations. I take it you also include the DMA there. There's no challenge to the constitutionality of the regulations as well as the DMA. Your client's case is the constitution demands a different legislative arrangement to deal with this pandemic. Is that correct? That is correct. And so what we are saying is that, of course, it's appropriate that the DMA is seen as Parliament's, let's call it, its first response in relation to this type of crisis, no question. Yeah. And we therefore do not have any quibble with the minister having exercised those appropriate responses immediately to do what is necessary and was necessary to confront the crisis as it rolled its way into the country. But yeah. that is never the complete answer because sitting alongside the DMA always is the question of parliamentary duties under the constitution. One doesn't say, well, I passed a law and therefore I've done my duty. Now I can sit and decide to do nothing further. There's always the question, obviously, as part of constitutional interpretation, and we will look at that obviously together when we look at the interpretation of the DMA. The question is, well, can parliament say I'm no longer obliged to exercise my primacy as lawmaker because the executive is doing so and the executive is doing so under this piece of legislation and absolutely we therefore do not challenge the regulatory powers that have been exercised up until this point we specifically have said as much we take no issue with them but we also do not challenge those powers under the dma as they've been exercised because we say that they've been constitutionally exercised but separate question entirely is can that continue can it be the case that the executive, just for an indefinite future, continues to exercise those powers when we know that the Constitution does demand that primacy of legislative lawmaking is exercised through the parliamentary process, and therefore that duty, when is it triggered? That's the question we need to confront in this case. And is the response by the government to say, we have discharged our duty by the DMA? That's our complete answer. Is that reasonable? Because, of course, the test of whether you've discharged a duty, the Constitutional Court has said in Metro Rail, is whether your response is reasonable. Is it reasonable in this day, half a year in, to continue saying our response is the DMA forever and a day? That is essentially the debate. And if, if that has assisted your lordships, then I will be able to immediately go to what I say is the first important chapter of our argument, which is why are these parliamentary constitutional goods so important? And we say they're very important to frame the debates about what the DMA and understanding of our case and an understanding of remedy. Because, and we say this with respect, it has been by our learned friends 
um, somewhat glossed over that there are these fundamental constitutional goods that inhere in lawmaking by parliament. The government respondents have it, my lords, that the minister may continue indefinitely as our country's primary lawmaker, despite parliament being long capacitated to legislate. We already know from April, parliament has been in a position to continue with its legislative agenda. It's said as much under oath. So we say that parliament's primacy must be restored. The parties thus then proceed from fundamentally different starting points. The government says that its approach is permitted by and completed by the DMA, whereas we say the starting point about lawmaking is the constitution. And fortunately for um, our case, we, we have the constitutional court on our side. The constitutional court is stressed in the de Toy case, and we've referenced it in our, in our heads of argument um, at uh, case line 052-24. The constitutional court in the de Toy case has stressed that all applicable laws must comply with the constitution and must be applied in conformity not with that legislation. The question is not whether the legislation is consistent with itself, but whether it is consistent with the constitution. So it's not the legislation that provides the principles and the values and sets the standards that your lordships are going to be uh, grappling with. It's the constitution. And so the DMA obviously must be read consistently with the constitution and its most fundamental constitutional principles. Now, now what are those fundamental constitutional principles when it comes to legislative lawmaking? We accept, and going back to your Lordship Presiding's point, we accept that regulation making is permitted under the DMA and has been exercised as an appropriate constitutional response to date. It's an important aspect of the regulatory state. We accept that. But we say that it cannot supplant the primary lawmaking function of parliament. And that is for various process and outcome related reasons. We have stressed them in our heads and I certainly won't take your lordships through them, other than to highlight these five features very, very briefly. The first reason you want parliament to enact laws is because it promotes the transparency, the participation, the openness and the accountability of those laws. And we've cited the constitutional court's decision in Ambrosini, where the chief justice said just that, he said that the public can only properly hold their elected representatives accountable if they're sufficiently informed of the relative merits of issues before the assembly. And in that respect, he engaged a fundamental feature of our democracy, which is participatory democracy. We say, we say it with respect, that participatory democracy is throttled, the life is throttled out of it when parliament does not need to legislate, but instead leaves it to the minister to use general stopgap powers to regulate ongoingly. And in that regard, we, we reference and we do wish to point to the importance of a passage in Doctors for Life. Of course, the court knows it, the case well, um, but the paragraphs are paragraphs 115 to 116. And, and I'm going to ask here for the wizardry of my juniors if they are able to pull that up onto the screen just because the passage is helpful for benefit uh, of this point. I'm not sure if it is coming up and whether they are able to do their magic, point me to it, but if yes, you... Yes, we have. Excellent. At those paragraphs, your lordships will see the court speaking about the importance of participatory democracy. And <clears throat> the passage in particular is this, the, the third sentence, the, well, it's the fourth sentence, starting the participation in paragraph 115. The participation by the public on a continuous basis provides fatality to the functioning of representative democracy. It encourages citizens of the country to be actively involved in public affairs and so on. It enhances the civic dignity of those who participate by enabling their voices to be heard. And it of course takes account of the spirit of democratic and pluralistic accommodation calculated to produce laws that are likely to be widely accepted and effective in practice. It strengthens the legitimacy of legislation in the eyes of the people. And finally, because of its open and public character, it acts as a counterweight Importantly, we've seen numbers of these complaints about the, the current um, process of lawmaking. It acts as a counterweight to secret lobbying and influence peddling. We don't suggest that there has been secret lobbying and influence peddling. We're not saying that, but there've been complaints about that. And this is a counterweight to that, which is the public process of lawmaking allows for people to feel as though these laws have been better passed, more legitimately passed, and that their voices have been taken. 
into account. Mr. Duplessis, just two points from my side. I mean, you, you started by saying that you, you don't seek to impugn the regulations or its content. No. And, and therefore, I think I think oblique references to what may be happening, as it were, behind the scenes uh, when you've made that concession, uh, and I say this with respect, may, may not be permissible in a sense that th there's been power peddling or whatever, because that, that's not the case you advance, correct? Ab uh, absolutely. But, say, say, oh, sorry. But, sorry. But, okay, but secondly, on the point of transparency and accountability, one must assume that given that the DMA is not being challenged, that the end product of the production of the DMA would have journeyed through the same process. And the DMA is the will of parliament. And therefore, the principles of transparency, openness and accountability were operational in the making of the DMA. Um, unless I understand your case to mean that the DMA creates a lacuna, and that is what triggers uh, the duty of Parliament. Because if the DMA doesn't create a lacuna, then one must accept that the DMA has been through the, the very principles that the Constitution requires it to, to, to traverse. Would that be so? And, and your case would really be that uh, all very well, but there's a lacuna in the DMA, and that's what triggers the need for Parliament to now further legislate. Yes. If we're not with you, if we're not with you, that there's a lacuna in the in in the DNA DMA, that would really be the end of your case, not so. I think it, I think the case turns pivotally on exactly the question your lordship has put to me. So our case is that there is an institutional lacuna in the DMA, that the DMA has recognised that there is an emergency response and powers accorded to the minister. One has to interpret those powers constitutionally, and so we say that they have to sit alongside the constitutional authority that we will reference around when there is a duty for parliament to regain its place. So absolutely, we, we accept that it is about an institutional lacuna. In relation to your lordship's first point, I stressed we do not take, we do not suggest that there is any validity in claims around what might have happened or not happened in respect of the regulation making process. But that there have been cases and that there have been criticisms, I think we can all accept what, are the, what we are simply highlighting is that the Constitutional Court's passage in the Doctors for Life case highlights one of the process outcomes, the important features of why we want a public process through Parliament, so that it can obviously give the maximum account for public participation and to avoid those types of outcomes. We don't suggest that there have been. We don't need to, but we are. No, I, 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 I accept that. I accept that. But similarly, I, I suppose you'll also accept that, even though the processes may be different the outcome of legislation that is generated through Parliament and the outcome of the regulation making process are all subjected to the same constitutional test at the end of the day, not so. They that, are, but that a, mem that a member of the public is entitled to challenge a piece of legislation as equally as they are entitled to challenge a regulation and the court would apply the same test in terms of its fidelity to the constitution, not so. Absolutely, the court will do so. But there are two, there are very different processes. And the point we wish to stress is that when regulation making is drafted, there is no general duty on the lawmaker to have an open consultative process, none whatsoever. Whereas when there is a parliamentary process, and as the passage I've just read from Doctors for Life confirms, there is that duty. And the reason that that duty is there and underlined by the Constitutional Court is to avoid any form of untoward backpedaling, backdoor in, insinuations, and all the rest that comes with it. That's the point that we would make. So, and I, I will highlight that in a second, uh, if, if I may, uh, when I continue with the points of constitutional goods that we say flow from constitutional lawmaking under Parliament's primacy. Um, my Lords, the second important feature sir, of the constitutional sorry, goods. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Duplessis. Yes, sorry. Before you. Sorry, before you depart that point, just on your response that there is an institutional lacuna in the DMA, I'm trying to understand that in light of your position that the DMA is not being challenged together with the regulations and so on. Now, I'm, I'm not sure whether I understand what, what you were referring to when you say there's an institutional lacuna in the DMA. Uh, I just thought before you depart that point, I must must ask that question. 
I'll answer it. Thank you, Justice. Uh, I'll, ask, I'll answer it immediately, but I am going to expand on it in a moment. So let me give you the immediate answer, but with the footnote that we're going to be dealing with that in slightly more detail when I come to the question of interpreting the DMA. The simple point is that as we see the DMA, it does constitutionally and acceptably provide government's immediate response to disasters, but it has to be interpreted constitutionally. Can it allow a situation where Parliament can wash its hands of any further lawmaking. If it is interpreted in that way, and we say it, it shouldn't be interpreted that way, but if it is interpreted in that way, it would then create an institutional lacuna in the sense that Parliament would be able to sit on its hands and not pass the laws that are necessary for the country's response to the pandemic. We say one can interpret the act constitutionally in a way which says no. It is a first response and it allows the minister to pass regulations to deal with the issue, no question, until such time as parliament has had an opportunity to regain its feet. And once it has had that opportunity, then it has to take back the power for lawmaking purposes. And so when one interprets it in that way, there is no institutional lacuna. One then sees that parliament's duty sits alongside the ministers. But when the minister's powers have been exercised, and the parliamentary process has been revitalized because it's now time passed and parliament can regain itself, then one must interpret that duty as being triggered for parliament. One can't allow parliament to say, well, we've passed the DMA, that's the end of the road for us. So that, that, that is where we're talking about an institutional lacuna. And we say yes. that that is a constitutional interpretation for various reasons, which I'll come to in a second, which must be the appropriate one. So it's, it's just, just as a thank you for, for that response, but just as a follow up on that, uh, maybe a, a rather obvious point, you accept that parliament in, in exercising its legislative powers has the power to delegate yes. to whomever yes. and to supervise uh, the, the person who has accepted that delegated power on an ongoing basis. You accept that? We accept entirely that there is there is a permissible regulatory process by which delegated laws can be made. We accept that. Regulatory delegation. This is a case about what we call where Parliament did what it did permissibly under the DMA to give to the executive a short term empowerment to respond to a crisis, including by making laws. But that cannot possibly be understood constitutionally as Parliament being permitted to abdicate its lawmaking powers for longer than is necessary, as we now sit for six months and potentially for another six months, perhaps more. The question is, can one interpret the DMA as permitting Parliament to do so? And we say no, for numbers of uh, reasons, including duties, but also because these constitutional goods, we say, need to be secured. What are these constitutional goods? They're the goods that, as the Constitutional Court said in Doctors for Life, are fundamental lawmaking goods. You ensure transparency, you avoid secret peddling, you ensure accountability, transparency, and most importantly, you ensure that the public is then given its space, its voice, to be able to obviously give its input into those laws. So that's why I'm saying at this point in time, it's important for us to at least remind ourselves with respect, of course, to the court of what those constitutional goods are because once you accept that those are constitutional goods that the court says we must fight for, then one helps, that is then a huge help to us understanding what the DMA allows and what it doesn't allow through a constitutional interpretation. So if I've answered that question for now, if I might just touch again on these constitutional goods, as I've already referenced from Doctors for Life, we know why it is that the court wants us to have lawmaking done through parliament. But in addition, the Constitutional Court has said that we do so, and we've quoted this in our heads, in order for the Constitution to show continuous respect. This is again Ambrosini's case. The court said, you need to show continuous respect, and we would wish for the court to underline that expression, continuous respect given to the rights of all to be heard and have their views considered. It's not a once-off opportunity through the DMA. The question is, how do you show continuous respect to the public's ability to give input into the laws that affect their lives. And that has to be done, says the Constitutional Court, through the parliamentary process. Thirdly, says the court, the Constitutional Court 
has been very clear about this point in particular, that you do so in order to ensure better outcomes. Why is it that we want Parliament to debate laws? Why does Parliament get public's input continuously on laws? It does so in order to ensure better outcomes, and Justice Sachs has said so in, in Masondo, and we've quoted that. Not only that, but it is also critical for the Constitution scheme itself to be discharged in relation to rights protection. Parliament is vested with the ultimate and primary lawmaking power, not for its own sake, not only because it wants to achieve these constitutional goods we've been referencing, about openness, transparency, and public input, continuous respect for people's voices and achieving better outcomes. But you want it so that it is the primary place where the state respects, protects, promotes, and fulfills the rights in the Bill of Rights. It's a Section 7.2 point. And we'll highlight how in the Western Cape, uh, we've seen in a decision um, in women's legal, uh, women's legal Trust case, where the court, a full court in the Western Cape has made that point emphatically. So for those reasons, we say it's not constitutionally acceptable for Parliament to be reduced for a sustained period, for there to be a lacuna under this interpretation of the minister and the president for a sustained period of time. It can't be reduced to merely approving or rejecting or recommending laws that have been crafted by the executive, because the result of that abdication, and to answer again your point, Justice Bakwa, it's not about delegation, it's about what we now have moved away from, we move beyond delegation of powers. We've moved now to a point where six months in, Parliament is saying it will not, under oath, it will not exercise its primary lawmaking powers. That is now in the realm of abdication. And the Constitutional Court, as I've said, says you never want to abdicate that power because then you immediately lose all these constitutional goods. But the Supreme Court of Appeal in the King case has stressed that if you were to do so, you would fail a fundamental feature of our constitutional democracy. And we've cited the King case. It's a judgment by His Lordship, uh, Mr. Justice Cameron and, uh, and uh, Nugent, uh, who wrote the majority decision or the decision. And at paragraph 51 of that judgment, we've cited it in our heads of argument at uh, 052-20. The court said very importantly, and we just highlight its central thrust, said to all of us that it is the assembly functioning in this way, in the way I've just been describing to you about constitutional goods. It is the assembly functioning in this way that the constitution entrusts the power to legislate. And it's an important word that the justices in the Supreme Court of Appeal used. It's not just that they were permitted to do so, they were entrusted with exercising that power to legislate. And they went on to say, its antithesis is a body that separates itself from and excludes the public and is indifferent to their participation and interests and conducts its business concealed from the public eye. And we would say that that is a clarion call for no abdication. You may not abdicate your power. When you decide to do so, that is the antithesis of a body that the Constitution envisages. But as we know, that's precisely what has happened. We know that Parliament's lawmaking function has been subverted it's been subverted not by the Disaster Act itself, and I must stress this because we had some of this debate between myself and the court, and it's an important debate. It's not been subverted. Parliament's lawmaking function has not been subverted by the Disaster Management Act itself. It's been by Parliament abdicating and abandoning its legislative function to the minister. And the result... Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Duplessis, the, the, the point of Parliament's lawmaking role being subverted would would only be good if we interpret the DMA to mean power is given as a stopgap measure, not so. If we interpret the DMA otherwise, then the problem lies not with 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 Parliament subverting, but the DMA would be, then be the problem. Would you agree with that? We we agree, and that's why that's why the, the interpretation of the DMA, but importantly, Justice Colifan through the lens of these constitutional goods and constantly keeping them upper in mind is so critical. And it's not just, as we say, in order to achieve these constitutional goods. I, I do need to finish off the point about constitutional goods by highlighting something particularly critical about this. The result is that if Parliament does not re-engage itself and does not 
achieve these constitutional goods, to pass laws in this open and transparent and deliberative forum, then one loses those goods. But we know as a fact that that's exactly what has happened in this case. In this respect, I am going to again ask for the wizardry of uh, my juniors to pull up the uh, fair trade. It's the FITA case that at least I think your lordship uh, presiding was one of the judges in. It's the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association versus the President case. And in particular, <clears throat> uh, paragraph 58 thereof. If it has been miraculously placed on your screen, please let me know. Yes, we have it. Excellent. Excellent. In that case, there was a debate about, well, what is the duty on Parliament in this case? What is the duty on the minister in this case in respect of public participation and consultation, the constitutional good that we've been debating? And in that case, you'll see at paragraph 58, in that case, Mr. Morana has indeed been in a number of these cases, as he points out. Um, and it says the counsel for the minister, Mr. Morana, submitted that if FITA appears to be confused regarding the standard of review, it refers to cases concerning the requirement of public participation in the legislative process and the requirement of ID in administrative decision-making. And he said that FITA was seeking to apply those to a case concerned with executive action. That case, as the court will appreciate, was a challenge to the executive lawmaking powers in respect of tobacco. Yes. And the debate was, well, did the minister have to consult anybody? And Mr. Moroni made the point that everybody had been confusing. They'd been confusing the legislative process where consultation is deeply required versus the minister's executive lawmaking powers under the DMA, where no such consultation is required. And he submitted, you'll see at the end of that passage, that executive action carries no general obligation to consult the public. <clears throat> and he then referenced the Law Society of South Africa, a constitutional court's decision, where the following is said, and it should be before you, at paragraph 87 of the Constitutional Court's judgment. It said, public participation, and I'd, with respect, if it hasn't been underlined on your screens, we would ask to draw emphasis to it. Public participation in the lawmaking process is a requirement specifically provided for in our Constitution that must be met by our lawmaking institutions. But participatory democracy is not provided for in similar terms in relation to the exercise of presidential or executive power. A little further down, and there's no legal provision or principle that even remotely imposes an obligation on the executive to invite the public to participate in its decision-making processes as proposed. So when we come to you and we say we would wish for Parliament's duty to be re-engaged, for its lawmaking powers to be exercised by it in response to this pandemic, when our rights are violated across the country in the response to the pandemic, we do so because we are wanting that constitutional goal to be achieved. As that passage confirms, and Mr. Morani had argued in the FITA case, that goal cannot be achieved by the minister in exercising the regulatory powers that she has been afforded under the DMA, because there's no duty of public cons consultation. The difference, of course, is that if Parliament's duties were reinvigorated, we would all have the opportunity for precisely that duty to be discharged in the manner in which the laws are then made. So we ask then for the court to appre appreciate with respect to it these important constitutional goals as we now come to a discussion of the DMA. As we speak about the DMA and our interpretation of it, we do so, of course, through the realm of the Constitution. We know that the boundaries of power relating to the operation of both parliaments and cabinets lawmaking duties are to be determined by the fundamental principles of our Constitution. And if I might deal with effectively the argument by our learned friends, because as the court has seen, the court has read our heads. It knows that we speak about the definition of disaster. It knows that we highlight that there are various features of the DMA which speak to the fact that it is intended to be what we will call complementary legislation. It is legislation that is meant to complement parliament in respect of other primary legislation. And we say that in that respect, it is a stopgap measure. If we might then just point out that Parliament and the executive have an argument against us that goes like this. 
They say, firstly, that the pandemic creates threats and harms and that they accept, and this is important, that dealing with COVID will necessarily lead to a limitation of rights. Therefore, they say, Parliament's obligations in terms of Section 7.2, including its legislative obligation, is engaged by COVID. So they accept that Parliament's obligations under 7.2, including its obligation to make laws, is engaged by this overwhelming problem we have to confront. But then they say, and this is the next step in their argument where we say they are fatally mistaken, they say Parliament has fulfilled that obligation by passing the DMA, which is, in their words, it's a complete and absolute, and I think in their heads they go so far as to say it's a wall-to-wall -wall response to the pandemic. But we say, with respect, that that's not so. There's a basic flaw at the heart of that argument, because the Act, when properly interpreted through the, re the realm of the Constitution and its constitutional goals I've already referenced, is clearly a complementary act to specific legislation, and it's confirmatory of specific legislation. The Disaster Act on any reading in its own terms does not deal with situations. It says it will not deal with other situations where other legislation deals with them. It's by its nature complementary, and it gives primacy to that legislation. It says that in Section 2. It says it's most important provision for purposes of this argument, it says that the Act does not apply. It simply does not apply where, in its words, an occurrence, importantly, the words are, can be dealt with effectively in terms of other national legislation. It doesn't say is dealt with effectively or will be dealt with effectively. It says the Act does not apply where an occurrence can be dealt with effectively in terms of other national legislation. Immediately there, there is an opportunity for an interpretation of the Act to sit comfortably alongside a duty on the Minister and the President and Parliament to initiate that COVID-specific legislation. Section 27.1, we obviously also reference, the Minister can only declare a national disaster and can only extend a national disaster in terms of Section 27.1 if existing legislation and contingency arrangements do not adequately provide for the national executive to deal effectively with a disaster. That is, again, a nod to the fact that ordinarily, if one can interpret this act as allowing these powers to be exercised only for so long as Parliament can provide existing legislation or other arrangements in response to it, well, then it must be obviously interpreted in that fashion. If it can be dealt with through other legislation, then Parliament's duties are triggered. And Section 26.1 says, even if a national disaster has been declared, the national executive has to deal with that national disaster in terms of existing legislation. And so we say, with respect, the Act itself, in various ways, highlights that it is not on its own terms, in its own structure, coherently. It's not a complete or an absolute or a wall-to-wall -wall legislative response. Its legislative purpose is intended to be complementary to other more specific legislation. And if there is that other legislation, then the DMA ceases to be operative. It necessarily defers to that legislation. And not only because of its own terms, but because of a constitutional reading of its terms. Mr. So, Mr. 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 Duplessis, so, so, sorry, sorry, J JP, you, you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, listening carefully to you, Mr. Duplessis, when you say you read that provision that says if a situation or a disaster can be dealt with in terms of other legislation, it presupposes that, correct me if I'm wrong, the executive has to make that judgment call to say the DMA will be ineffective to deal with that. Therefore, it must therefore initiate the necessary legislative process through parliament to deal with that situation. Am I understanding you correctly? The, the, definitely those two powers, uh, my Lord, go hand in hand. The executive has the power to initiate, prepare, and then in, uh, and introduce legislation, as we know, under Section 85 yes. of the Constitution. Yes. yes. But once that power is initiated, of course, then it is in tandem with Parliament's power, and we say in this case a duty to then in fact pass that law through its yes, process. I understand yes. that. 
at some stage, because we have the DMA, you say the executive must make that judgment call that we need separate legislation to deal with this situation. Is that what you say? And it would do so, JP, uh, with respect, it would do so recognizing all of these other constitutional goals that we've mentioned in order for them to be achieved. And it yes. would do so recognizing that there is going to come a point in any stage of a pandemic where parliament is able to say, and the executive is able to say, well, whatever we've been doing emergency-wise for the last couple of weeks or even months, we are now back on board and we can then begin to do our usual processes, indeed. Thank you. Judge Colopin had a question as well. Mr. Duplessy, my question was the following, that on, on the one hand, um, if one has regard to the constitutional scheme and the values and the uh, admitted benefits of transparency, participation and openness, then it may well be accepted that it would be desirable for, for Parliament to, as it were, legislate to deal with all of these issues. But there's a difference between what is desirable and, and what is constitutionally mandated. Uh, and getting back to the DMA, um, Parliament had the opportunity through the consultative, transparent, open process to apply its mind to whether the DMA would be a stopgap measure or a measure to deal with uh, disasters in general for a, for a longer period of time. And having done so, they determined that a disaster would last for three months unless it was extended and then applied their minds to the question of the extension of a disaster and indicated that it would be extended on a monthly basis. If it was Parliament's intention to put a ceiling to the extendability of the DMA in respect of any particular disaster, then surely as lawmaker, it was open for them to do so. And they could say, simply by example, a disaster could be extended on a monthly basis, provided that it wasn't extended for more than three months or four months. And does that not uh, provide some indication that the clarity of the language used by Parliament is such that to suggest that the DMA was intended to be a stopgap measure may well strain the language of the DMA? Uh, as as uh, Justice Kentridge reminded us in, in Zuma. Um, Justice Colopin, if I might answer in this way. Firstly, of course, the fact that they've decided to do what they've done is absolutely no indication of the constitutionality of the DMA under the interpretation I posited to you. In other words, the fact that the executive or parliament read the DMA in the way that they have and that they've decided to extend the disaster, uh, is of absolutely no assistance to this court's duty to obviously interpret the legislation. And we know that from Marshall and the Constitutional Court's decision in Marshall. There you'll recall that the Constitutional Court was faced with the question of whether an interpretation of a particular SARS uh, practice should be given any form of weight by the court because SARS is the experts in that field have decided to do something. And the Constitutional Court rejected that saying whatever parliament or the executive may think they're entitled to do is not the answer to the question. The question is the constitution's answer. The second question, of course, is that, or the second point, of course, is that they have extended with respect. We accept that they have, but they've done so on the basis of a mistaken interpretation of where their duty lies. They think that they can continue to extend and discharge the duty by virtue of the DMA. But we're asking the court to recognize that there is a different duty that they have. There is a duty which are, is... Are you, sorry, a, a, are, are you oh, saying, sorry. sorry to interrupt you, but are you saying those extensions are valid or are they invalid? No, we're saying, we're saying up until this point, those extensions have been valid. We are not retrospectively trying to undo any of the extensions. We are saying that this case now is where we are looking back. They've done what they've done. And they've now under oath told this court that they are not going to change their practices. They're going to continue extending under this act. And they continually say they will not engage their legislative powers in any, any shape or form. They've made that clear. So now the court is faced with a situation, and the Western Cape case is very similar to this, and I'll come to it when we speak about remedy, the, the women's legal trust case. There too, Parliament said, we're not going to pass laws dealing with Muslim divorces. We're just not going to. It's not our duty. And the court said, well, 
whatever you think you, you're entitled to do as the legislature, we as the courts are going to tell you that for various reasons, that duty has been triggered. And, and Justice Collipin, you absolutely correctly said to me earlier, you said, well, the question is, Parliament thinks it's permitted to do so. The question is, are they, are they entitled to continue doing so? And that's the debate. We say no, no longer. There are numbers of answers to why they're no longer permitted to do so. If I might, if I might take the point a little further by way of a thought experiment, because the question put to me by Justice Collipin does um, engage this idea of further extensions. Section 27 of the DMA makes clear that the limitation is not a time limitation. It's rather when other legislation is in place to adequately deal with a disaster. You've got to read section 27, 1 and 25 together. So it's not just a case of saying, well, you, you, can, you can continue to do this for as long as you want to. It's, it's time bound by linked expression to when other legislation is in place to adequately deal with the disaster. So that's the first important point. And I might make the point again, <clears throat> and expressly because we do think this is important through a, a hypothetical. In answer to Justice Collipin's point, if Parliament were today to pass legislation that deals specifically with COVID, just to understand the structure of the Act and to see what our points are, if Parliament today were to pass legislation that deals specifically with COVID, what would be the consequences under the Act? Well, firstly, in terms of Section 27.1, of the Act, read with 27.5, the minister would need to terminate the national state of disaster and couldn't extend it. Why? Because there would then be, to use the wording of the section, there would be existing legislation and contingency arrangements that adequately provide for the national executive to deal effectively with COVID. Secondly, and in any event, COVID could be dealt with effectively in terms of the COVID-specific national legislation. If that's the position, then of course, in terms of section 2.1, the Disaster Act would cease to apply to COVID because we know section 2.1 says the minister would then be required to identify the COVID specific legislation in the Gazette under section 2.1b Roman 2. So we know that if this law were passed, the DMA's own structure, its own language, highlights how the minister's powers would be decommissioned. That law would then become the appropriate response to COVID. And thirdly, and again, in any event, once there was COVID-specific legislation, Section 26.1 of the Act says that the executive would be required to deal with COVID in respect of that legislation. That's precisely what the Act envisages. And our point is that when one looks at the Act's referencing to itself being complementary to other legislation, then it reinforces the idea that the Act cannot be interpreted as a wholesale abdication of the legislature's responsibility to make laws in response to this type of pandemic. Quite the opposite. It recognizes that ordinarily the legislature is the place where such laws must be made, but that that institutional lacuna, to use the words that Justice Bakwa put to me earlier, that institutional lacuna can only exist under the Act for so long as Parliament is not able to reassert itself. We know in this case it has been from April already, asserted into its legislative agenda um, perfectly well. So the question is not a case of capacity. It's a question of why is it not exercised its lawmaking powers in this context? And we say that the approach we've adopted is perfectly consistent with the Act's purpose. Not only does the language I've just mentioned speak to the Act <clears throat> seeking to place primacy outside of the Act, if that is possible, but it's also obviously the purpose of the Act. The minister's empowerment is not open-ended. The minister is empowered under the DMA only when and only for so long as there is no other existing concrete and effective mechanism to deal with the threat. And there are time, as we call them, time-sensitive facts. In other words, you need to respond urgently, which prevent the legislature from taking its rightful place as the lawmaker. That's its purpose. It, it, it exists to regulate those thankfully very rare circumstances where serious threats threaten to overwhelm. We need an immediate response. Why? Not only because we need an immediate response, but because we need to give time for the relevant actors of the state to get themselves gathered together again to discharge their obligations. And there is the fundamental obligation 
the fundamental obligation. It is its fundamental obligation, namely for Parliament to pass laws. And we say that, so not only on the text of the Act, but its purpose as well, and indeed in conjunction with a number of constitutional principles, that would be the appropriate response to the ministers and the president's argument about the DMA as being a wall-to-wall -wall response. We said it can't be a wall-to-wall -wall response. And it can't be for at least these important constitutional reasons. So quite aside from the text of the act, quite aside from its purpose, these constitutional reasons we say reinforce our argument. Firstly, you need to adopt that interpretation in order to achieve the constitutional goods I spoke about earlier, and I won't go through that again. The second is, of course, this is a pandemic which impacts on rights so thoroughgoingly, so overwhelmingly, that it is simply unimaginable that Parliament, the primary lawmaker in the country, can for an untold and inordinate time simply say, we're not going to make laws. Our primary function, we're not going to do it. And we say that that is absolutely critically important in light of a overriding principle of our constitutional law, which is the doctrine against abrogation. I've already mentioned the King judgment where Justices Cameron and Nugent said, if, if the National Assembly were to effectively shut itself down as a lawmaker, that would be the antithesis, to use their words, of that type of body doing the work that was, again, their word, entrusted to them, which is lawmaking. And so we saw a, pro a proper interpretation of the act. It was never meant ongoingly to apply to such problems or to represent Parliament's complete response thereto. That doctrine against excessive uh, delegation or abrogation has been reiterated by the Constitutional Court, and we've said as much in JASA. We, we've referenced in our heads the Justice Alliance of South Africa case. It's a decision of the Constitutional Court. And if I might, <clears throat> with respect, uh, have an opportunity to just draw your attention in your own time to paragraph 60 and 61 of that judgment. I won't read it now. I think the principle is sufficiently obvious. The Constitutional Court said that Parliament should not assign a plenary legislative power to another body. It may not ordinarily delegate its essential legislative functions. We accept that it might have been able to permissibly do so under the DMA for the minister's immediate short-term stopgap response. We accept that. But it cannot possibly be correct that it is an ongoing and thoroughgoing abdication of responsibility forevermore. So we stress, we do not say that Parliament has in fact unconstitutionally delegated lawmaking power. We don't say that. Properly interpreted, the Disaster Act does no such thing. It's predicated on Parliament and the National Executive fulfilling their constitutional obligations as soon as they are reasonably able to, to initiate and to prepare and to implement the appropriate lawmaking that they are encouraged and entrusted to do. And that then leads me to our final point in support of this with respect to <clears throat> the argument, and that is we say that they have failed in their duty. And it's not a light failure. It's not a small failure. It's a fundamental failure because they failed in their most fundamental task. They failed in their lawmaking duties. So we talk now about that duty having been triggered, and that's the third chapter of our argument about a duty. Up until now, I've been arguing that a constitutional interpretation of the DMA sees it as a critically important stopgap response, and that Parliament's silence is permitted really only for so long as, as is necessary. We say it is not a sufficient response, and it's not a reasonable response for Parliament and the executive to say, our duty and our work is done in the DMA. We passed that a long time ago, and that's what's being used. We say no. And our argument for a duty has three short steps to them. Firstly, one has to understand the context of the rights curtailments in this context and case. Second, one has to understand the Constitution's very clear articulation of positive duties imposed in that context. And third, one has to, of course, recognize the difference between lawmaking and oversight. That's a problem our learned friends uh, repeatedly collapse. So our first reason for a duty is, what context are we dealing with here? my lords. We perhaps have become a bit inured to it, and I say that certainly personally as, as, as somebody that has now, alongside all of us, lived under this particular regime 
of lawmaking now for nearly six months, one has become somewhat inured to the idea that this is just how it is. But we are still living with a situation where through regulatory lawmaking by the minister, we know, obviously looking back, we've had massive curtailments of, law, of rights across the entire country, but we're still living with a curfew. There's still continuing economic exclusions. There's still no international travel. The government's own case is this disaster is not going anywhere and that the levels may be heightened again. So the context is crucial. Within this context of a national threat on a daily and ongoing basis, impacting thoroughly and pervasively upon rights, we say that it is quite clear that it is not that the legislature has a power, as our learned friends say it, which then entitles them to decide when and if they want to exercise their lawmaking power. We say it's a power which in this case, because of these rights violations, triggers a duty. COVID, impa COVID impacts virtually every single right in our Bill of Rights. And so we would reference with respect the Women's Legal Center Trust case. I mentioned that we would come to that. And again, if I would ask my learned juniors just to pull it up, uh, paragraphs 145, uh, 151, 152, and 181 of that case are of importance uh, to the argument. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping again that their magic is being performed on your screens. Yes, we have it. That's the Women's Legal Center Trust case, isn't it? Indeed. And yeah. that case, as I've previously said, um, uh, to <laughs> Biding, that case dealt with a very, very helpful analogue it was a question of whether Parliament has, had exercised its seven two duties to pass a law in response to the problem of Muslim marriages. And you'll see at paragraph 145, the court said, according to the applicants, the obligation for the state to recognize Muslim marriages and their consequences flows directly from the Bill of Rights. In this regard, they rely on seven two of the Constitution, which we know, and section 237, which we also know, requires all obligations to be performed diligently and without delay. Then if one goes a bit further to paragraph 151, they say the state respondents deny, as in our case, that section 7.2 imposes the duty to enact legislation. According to them, the executive is vested with, these are your words, Justice Colophon, earlier, a discretion and not an obligation to prepare and initiate legislation. And in the debate I was having with your lordship, I was saying, well, it's one thing for them to say, well, we've got a discretion and it's our choice to decide how we're going to respond. But the question, the tr critical question we say, is whether that discretion in this case is coupled with a duty. So in this case, we say according to them, or according to them at paragraph 151, the executive is vested with the discretion, not an obligation. And so is the legislature conferred with legislative powers and not obligations. At 152 said the court, section 72 does not define the steps the state should take in affording protection, promotion, and fulfillment of those rights. This is unlike certain provisions which have been highlighted by the state respondents, where there's an express obligation imposed upon the state. So what is implied, and this is our case, is exactly where we are. What is implied, however, in Section 7.2 is that the steps taken must be reasonable and effective. Clearly, an obligation is imposed on the state to give effect to the rights contained in Chapter 2 of the Constitution. And so that re reiterates this point. Is the DMA, and an answer that says the DMA is our full response, it's our complete response to this disaster, is that a reasonable response to, to discount discharging the obligation to pass laws under the Constitution. If one goes a little further to paragraph 181 of that judgment, the court said this, and I hope again that it's on your screen, while the state has the authority to determine how to fulfill its section two duty, this must necessarily be in line with the Constitution. In this instance, given the nature of the rights violations, and we stress, in our case, given the nature of the rights violations by this pandemic, the ongoing nature of it, the thoroughgoing nature of it, in the context of the complexity and the importance of marriage, or in this case, in the context of the complexity and the importance of responding to this one in a century crisis, the only reasonable means of fulfilling the Section 7.2 duty is through the enactment of legislation. So said that court. The Constitutional Court and it references uh, Metro Rail in the judgment too, but the court will know Metro Rail, the Constitutional Court stressed that there's a difference when it comes to Section 7.2. You've both got a negative obligation as the state, but you've also got a positive obligation. 
you've got a duty to take action to pass laws, as the legislature said, the Constitutional Court, where the rights implicated demand that response. And so the duty here is to take positive measures to protect rights. We're not just asking Parliament to do its lawmaking functions because we want constitutional goods of openness and transparency and public input to be achieved, as important as they are. The reasonableness of what we say is the response through Parliament is aligned with its duty to take positive measures to protect rights. As I said earlier, if your primary job as the legislature is to make laws, then it is the legislature's job to respect, protect, and promote the rights and the Bill of Rights through the making of those laws. And so it's in that context that we say a reasonableness standard has been adopted. We've highlighted that Justice O'Regan in Metro Rail has stressed that measures adopted are ultimately questions of reasonableness. But before I get to that, if I might again just draw attention to paragraph 85 of Her Ladyship's judgment in Metro Rail, because it's critical to understanding what we say is the duty engaged in this case. I have asked my juniors again to be able to just pull it up for you. But at paragraph 85, she says in a passage starting, our constitution constructs and restrains the exercise of public power in our democracy. I'm hoping it's before you, um, yes. just my lord. Yep. Determining the scope of public power, and we would stress that language, determining the scope of public power, therefore, and any duties attached to it requires an analysis not only of the statutory provisions conferring the power, but also of the social, political, and economic context within which the power is to be exercised in a consideration of the relevant provisions of the Constitution. And that's a context-driven approach, she says. And she says, the factors, she goes on in paragraph, uh, I think it's eight, eight of her judgment. She says, the factors that would ordinarily be relevant would include the nature of the duty. Let me just pause there. The nature of the duty in this case is one of the most fundamental conceivable. It's lawmaking, goes to the heart of our constitutional democracy. Secondly, she says the duty, the question is how closely that duty is related to the core activities of that body. Well, the duty could not be more corely and closely related to the activities of parliament as lawmaker. It's the legislative branch of government that must do its job. She says, you must also consider the extent of any threat to fundamental rights should that duty not be met and the intensity of any harm that may result. And we say, really, cut it quest here. Here you've got the most prevailing problem and ultimately curtailment of rights arising therefrom that I think any of us have experienced in our lifetimes under this particular crisis across the board. And in that context, we speak to the idea of these rights ultimately being absolutely critically engaged by way of a duty on Parliament to exercise its lawmaking responses there too. And finally, if you just look a little further down the page, she says, yeah. oh. sorry, Justice Parker. Oh. Yeah, maybe let me allow you to complete the reference that you are making to, to that, and then it, I'll pose the question. Just, thank you, my Lord. It was just a little further down. You'll see in that very passage of paragraph 88, she says, in particular, an organ of state will not be held to have reasonably performed a duty simply on the basis of a bold assertion of resource constraints. And we, we would stress here, there's no, it's no good for the state to plead resource constraints or capacity issues in our case either. In any event, and I stress this, Parliament has now had five months. It has had the time to gather itself. And worse still, it says to us under oath that it will do nothing. It's not going to do anything. But in the context, we also would have assumed that the executive in this realm, the president, would perhaps have been slightly more satisfied to, at this point, be able to hand over some of the legislative making to parliament indeed. Because, of course, an incredibly onerous burden has befallen the minister to have to pass these regulations and be the lawmaker in circumstances where uh, the duty can be discharged by the rightful organ of state in the form of parliament. Uh, in those circumstances, we are somewhat surprised that the minister uh, has not been uh, happy to have that duty discharged by parliament. Yes, sorry, I, I know there was a question. Yes, um, isn't the challenge that the applicant faces here the one 
that arises from the fact that the duty to legislate by parliament is triggered specifically where the relevant sections are mandatory. In other words, where the section says parliament shall pass laws and so on and so on in this regard. In other words, where the relevant provisions are not permissive. The sections that you rely on, 7 2, 42, 3, 44, 1, 55, 1, and 60, 68, would appear to be permissive. And I think the respondents make that point in their heads. And by being permissive, those sections preserve Parliament's discretion to make laws. That is, uh, sorry. You, you are basing, uh, the applicant bases uh, its case on permissive pro provisions. And you are asking this court to, to go into that realm of the permissive powers of parliament and to tell parliament, make this law. And that's, that's part of what you asked for in your notice of motion. Is, is, is that permissible to start yes. with? Uh, I couple that to the question that I make to say there, there, is, there is none of these sessions, nothing that triggers the duty that you have addressed us about. And, and I'm suggesting that that is the challenge that you face. You're asking this court to make what is not obligatory um, for parliament to do. And you want this court to say, go on and do it. Can we do that? Uh, yes. Mr. Dupesi, just before you respond, I see we are a minute away to, to our obligatory tea, tea break as a bench and constitutionally entrenched benefit. Um, I just wanted to check how far do you still have to go? I know the bench has asked you a number of questions and you've gone beyond the hour that you, you had at your disposal. How far do you still have to go in, in addition to answering the question that Judge Bako has asked you? I've got 10 more minutes. 10 I more think. minutes. Okay. okay. Um, why don't we take the break now and then um, you will then respond to the question and then uh, conclude your argument. Would that be okay? That would be fine. Thank you, Judge. I think what we'll do, we'll just mute ourselves and stop the camera. Uh, we, we, we'll adjourn for the... <clears throat> the 15 minutes that we are entitled to, and then we'll come back at uh, exactly 11.45. Thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Parliament to exercise its lawmaking responses. It is from the fact that they are pass laws and so on and so on in this regard. This is the challenge that you face. You're asking this court to make what is not
to we'll just mute ourselves and stop the camera. Uh, we, we, we'll adjourn for the <clears throat> the 15 minutes that we're entitled to, and then we'll come back at uh, exactly 11:45. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Parliament to exercise its lawmaking responsibility is from the fact that we are passed laws and so on and so on in this regard is the challenge that you face you're asking this court to make what is not we will just mute ourselves and stop the camera uh, we, we will adjourn for the <clears throat> the 15 minutes that we're entitled to and then we'll come back at uh, exactly 11:45 thank you Thank you very much, okay. Responsibility. It's from the fact that we are passed laws and so on and so on in this regard is the challenge that you face. You're asking this court to make what is not true. We'll just mute ourselves and stop the camera. Uh, we, we will adjourn for the, <coughs> the 15 minutes that we're entitled to, and then we'll come back at uh, exactly 11.45. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Right, it's uh, 11.45. Uh, Mr. Tuplessy, I see you back in, I would imagine. Everyone else is back in. <clears throat> yes, I see Advocate Morane is there. Um, I don't see Advocate uh, Maleka. I'm, I'm oh, here, Judge. I had okay. just muted myself. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Duplessis, you said 10 minutes. Please go thank, you. thank you. If I might respond to the question posed just before tea. So yes. it's absolutely correct that there's no uh, particular provision in the Constitution that we've invoked uh, around lawmaking powers, Justice Bakwa, that speaks to there being a duty. It's permissive. It says that they may and that they can pass laws. But of course, they need to be read consistently with the duty that is imposed upon them under Section 7.2 of the Constitution. And so it's a power, we say, coupled with a duty. In our heads of argument, we've given the constitutional court cases which make it clear that there are very many instances where the court will choose to interpret a power as, in fact, imposing an obligation. And we've given the decisions, for example, of the Van Royen case versus the GCB. But, <clears throat> of course, in this matter, we've also got the very useful examples of both Glenister uh, and the Women's Legal Center case. Because let me just take the Women's Legal Center case, which was about whether there was a duty on Parliament to pass a law dealing with Muslim marriages. Uh, Justice Buckwood, there's no provision in the Constitution that imposes any obligation on anybody to pass a law dealing with Muslim marriages. Similarly, in Glenister, the case was about whether there was a duty to pass a law in order to create a proper corruption fighting unit there's no particular provision in any part of the Constitution that imposes an obligation on the state to create a corruption fighting unit. But what the courts did in both those cases is they interpreted the rights violations that were taking place. Right. In other uh, words, the Section 72 obligation that was engaged. And they said that uh, the state's legislative power, it has a power, Everyone must be by way of a duty. <clears throat> discharged because of those rights violations. And the courts made that clear in yeah, both those cases. Advocate so Moran's it there. wasn't uh, allowing um, Parliament in uh, the permissive state that um, uh, Parliament wishes to remain here. Malika. The court said, no, I'm, I'm here you might have a power, but you must now actually go ahead and pass that law. And we specifically, uh, I read from uh, the Women's Legal Center a little so earlier, but if, the if you'll just be reminded, at paragraph so 151 and 152, you'll no, see the court, in fact, deals specifically with that. that. It says there, the state respondents uh, denied that once that section 72 imposes the duty to enact legislation. According to them, Justice Bakwa, exactly the point you were making with me, the executive is vested with a discretion and not an obligation to prepare and initiate legislation. And so is the legislature conferred with legislative powers and not obligations. But then if you read further, the court says at paragraph 152 onwards, it says, no, section 72 in fact obliges them to exercise that power that they've got, given the manifest nature of the rights violations that have taken place in that case. So that is our answer. We do it through the remit of section 72, and we highlight that that is the therefore a duty that needs to be discharged by them. If I might then <clears throat> come to the second part of your question, Justice Bakwa, it was, well, can this court order them to do so? And that really takes us directly to remedy. So if I can try and finish uh, my submissions by briefly engaging that topic. We have said that the, the DMA has to be interpreted in a manner which is constitutionally acceptable. So the first point about remedy is that we're not seeking to strike the DMA down. We're not seeking to strike any of the regulations that have been made under it down. We're simply saying that one needs to interpret the DMA but consistently with this duty to make laws through Parliament that we've referenced. And the DMA, as we've said, uh, in other words, the JP, we've said this, that it opens the legislative space. In fact, it favours the legislative space being used by Parliament. Because it says in Section 2, that's an objective inquiry for this court. When is the Disaster Management Act applicable? It's not applicable when Parliament or the Executive decides so. 
It's an objective question that the court, with respect, needs to interpret. And the Act says, in very clear terms in Section 2, it will not be applicable, it will not work, it will not have any future work in circumstances where there is, as we know, the court, in fact, deals specifically with an occurrence that, says in its words, can be dealt with effectively in terms of other national legislation. According to that's an objective test. The court's exactly inquiry today is to decide that question. Can this particular pandemic be dealt with objectively by another law through Parliament doing its duty to pass that law? That's the debate. And we say, therefore, there is a need for this court to give a remedy in that regard. There's a need for that remedy, firstly, because the government denies that it has an obligation. The government says we don't have an obligation to pass a law. We've done all that is required by the DMA being passed years ago. That's their answer. And they say that they will not take back the lawmaking that needs to be discharged. So under oath, they've stressed that they're not going to begin the process of parliamentary lawmaking in response. So it's an ongoing failure up until this point, and it's an indefinite failure going ahead. So therefore, it certainly is necessary for the court to say something about that. The relief that we the, have the asked DMA for has been has to be modelled quite particularly. That hasn't been, so the first with respect, about really dreamt up by us. It has been modelled the on the now. order that has been granted by the Constitutional Court in Metro Rail. Metro Rail was a case dealing with a positive duty, as I've already said, to take action to respect and protect rights. And in that case, the government. Uh, or the, uh, the, the respondents, rather, had denied that they bore those obligations. They specifically said, we don't have obligations to protect people on these particular trains. And said the Constitutional Court, it is therefore important that the court issues a declaratory order to that effect. If you see paragraph 92 of that judgment, and again, I hope my, uh, my helpful juniors can pull it up for you. It's at 053. Dash 2053. The court, with respect, needs to you'll see what um, Justice O'Regan said there. She said, from their affidavits and their argument to this court, it was clear that neither Metrorail nor the commuter corporation considered that they bore any obligation in relation to the security of rail commuters and that they did not interpret the void as something they had to fill. That's, that's the language of institutional lacuna in our case. Parliament does not see itself as having to fill any void in this matter. They say that. They have already done their job with the DMA. Well, what did the court go on to say in paragraph 109, and that's at uh, case line 053-2057? And it's an important passage because it answers the need for declaratory relief, and it also answers the point you raised with me, Justice Bakwa. Can this court order that something be done? Said Justice O'Regan, she said, in this case, Metro Rail and the Commuter Corporation denied in error that they bore obligations to protect the security of rail commuters. But given the importance of that obligation in the context of public rail commuter services, it is important that this court issue a declaratory order to that effect. And the applicants also sought an order, she said, in which this court would put Metro Rail and the commuter corporation on terms to take steps to implement that order. And what did she say next? She said, while such an order is no doubt competent, so the court can order that you must discharge your obligations. It's perfectly competent. The court said, we don't need to do so in this case, because for various reasons which are not germane. If I might underscore what I've just said by referencing again the Women's Legal Trust case, because that deals specifically with a question of a parliamentary failure to legislate. The, as we know, in particular in this case, the Speaker objects to an order requiring Parliament to to enact legislation. But if your um, uh, pages on your screens can show a paragraph 188 of the Women's Legal Trust case, from there onwards, the court deals very helpfully and analogously with the remedy we are seeking in this matter. At paragraph 188, just before the heading remedy, you'll see the court says, the steps taken by the executive respondents by introducing the bill or contemplating an omnibus bill seem to be an acknowledgement that legislation is the most reasonable and effective way of protecting the rights implicated. I would ask you to pause, please. In our case, you could reword that. The steps taken by the executive respondents in our case to use the DMA to make the regulations that they have up until this point is an acknowledgement that legislation is the most reasonable and effective way of protecting rights. The question is, is it enough? Should it be done by a different body 
as, as Justice Collipin put to me, is this a question of locus? Yes, says the, the court. This remedy does not dictate to the other arms what options to take. The court is not involved in what form the legislation should take. Whether or not the relevant parties decide to vary or revive the bill that has been in discussion for many years, introduce new legislation, vary current marriage legislation, or adopt omnibus legislation remains a choice for the executive and the legislature. Similarly for us, we are not asking the court to prescribe any particular form of relief. But then if you go on, you'll see at paragraphs 193 and 194 what the court says. What did she say next? She says, if the court is minded to find that the cabinet and parliament have failed their section 7.2 duties, then this court must declare such conduct to be invalid, and the court may, we know, suspend the declaration. At 194, the court says a declarator stating the constitutional obligations of the state in terms of section 7.2 is appropriate. So is a declarator that the state has failed to fulfill its constitutional obligations, and the court references the treatment action campaign decision. If one goes a bit further to paragraph 200, again a very useful passage, it says, although it may not be appropriate to find that Parliament has failed to fulfil its duty at this stage, it is, however, just an equitable to make an order that requires both the executive and the legislature, as part of the state, to work in collaboration within their constitutionally defined roles by rectifying the failure identified and by fulfilling their section 7.2. Obligations. So we ask for precisely that type of relief. We're not asking for this court at all to police how Parliament exercises its duty, but that it has a duty triggered, the court needs to declare, and that the executive alongside it needs to take its appropriate steps to implement COVID-specific laws, we say, similarly falls for the court to issue. And it can do so by way of the relief that we have indicated. In that respect, we would finally leave for the court the judgment of the Constitutional Court and its order in economic freedom fighters. And at paragraph 212 of that judgment, the Constitutional Court specifically said that it would be just and equitable in that case to direct the Assembly to perform its constitutional obligations, and it said in its order that the failure by the National Assembly in that case to do its legislative duty constitutes the violation of that section, and that the National Assembly must comply with Section 237 of the Constitution and do its duty. And we say, of course, that it's not a separation of powers violation for this court to tell another branch of government to exercise its duty. Indeed, it's respecting the separation of powers by reminding Parliament of its better self and saying to it, this is a critically important stage of our case, this is a critically important stage, rather, I mean, of this, this epidemic, and as a result, it's necessary for the appropriate role-maker uh, um, role in that context to perform its duties and pass the laws that are required. I, I'm not sure, if I might say just briefly, whether there's much that I need to say about the issue of costs. I am happy to um, hear what our learned friends have to say as to whether they persist with the question of costs against us. If they do, then I, I, I will reserve my rights to say something about it in reply. Um, but for present purposes, those are our submissions, unless there are any other questions. Obligation. Thank you very much. So Mr. We ask for um, I don't think there are any. I see Judges Bakwa and Kolopin are quiet. So I'm going to invite Advocate Maleka to address. Thank you, Judge President. I hope that you can all hear me. We can hear you. Would it be constraining you to request that you address us on the main issue? that uh, occupied Mr. Duplessis, and you can take for granted we know what the argument is on the three preliminary issues you've raised. Uh, I'm not precluding you from saying anything about that but I'm just saying let's let's engage with the main issues and then if you still have time at the end and you want to say something about agency, standing or subsidiarity, you're welcome to. And it said Thank you, Judge President. I will not say anything more in regard to those topics uh, beyond the submissions we have made in our heads. Yes. I prefer to respond to the oral submissions made by our colleague, colleagues for the applicant. And I do so in the light of the exchange that has taken place between him and members of the bench.
by reminding I'd like to make certain preliminary observations before I get to the heart of our response to the oral submissions. The first is to follow upon the searching question which all of you have directed to our learned friend for the applicants, I'm not sure if I'm especially the question which Justice Bakwa directed to, uh, up to the applicant, um, that the fundamental basis it, of the provisions of the Constitution he relies do, on I, I will reserve my right to, say to invoke a duty. Um, but do not expressly provide for a duty to enact the kind of legislation he propounds, but that those provisions are formulated as permissive plenary powers. The response of our learned friend, as we understand it, is to accept that the provisions of the Constitution concerned are formulated through permissive plenary powers of lawmaking by parliament. But he seeks to impose a duty, not by pointing to any specific provision of the constitution. He seeks to respond, not by providing clear evidence in the founding of the David of a violation of a specific fundamental right at issue in these proceedings. And what he does is to make an assumption that there have been violations of fundamental Rights, Thank you, Judge on the basis of which several cases he parrots found and support the duty he contends uh, for. With the greatest of respect to our Lenin case. Yes. the cases he relies on, chapter by chapter, do not support the proposition he makes. And so, for instance, if we were to take three of the main cases he relies on, it is quite clear that they don't deal with the kind of case at issue here. You take, for instance, the Doctors for Life case. Response it was manifestly concerned the first with an express constitutional duty of parliament to facilitate public participation in lawmaking processes. That duty was expressly identified in section 59 of the constitution. Nothing of the sort in this case. The same duty was the one that triggered the debate in the King case before the Supreme Court of Appeal. Alain Prince sought to, to imply that duty finally by relying on the Women's Legal Center's case. But that those provisions we have looked at that case again. We accept that it raises consideration of the, the duty of on Parliament and members of the executive under Section 27 of the Constitution. Of the Constitution but it's a duty which was triggered based on the evidence and the conclusion in that case by the Constitutional Court that the existing Marriages Act not by pointing to did not sufficiently provide for the recognition of the Muslim marriages. And for that reason, it created a lacuna. That lacuna brought about an issue in these proceedings. And what he does is to make an assumption that then there's some been violations of I'm not too sure where it comes from. On the basis yeah, of which whether it's a separate competition from found and support the duty. I content. think it oh, is, I don't know. I think whoever is controlling this platform must just check where that noise is coming chapter from. Chapter and uh, what I do, I simply exclude whoever is doing that because they know. So, for instance, if you were to take three of the main cases you know. he relies on. Please continue, Advocate Malika. In that case, the Women's Center case, the court expressly identified the right that was violated with an express inconsistent with the provisions of the equality clause and the anti-discrimination clause in section 9 of the constitution and it therefore issued a, an order directing parliament to pass a legislation that can remedy that constitutional violation so we would for that reason ask the court to compare the order which was made in that case especially the order set up from paragraph 252 of that case you will see that there is an express declaration made by the court in that case 
of the violation based on the equality provisions of section 9 of the constitution flowing from which there was a direction that parliament should remedy the violation by considering a legislation that is not the case when one oh, sorry mr mr Maleka, can i can i just uh, check if i understand you correctly you're saying that the use of must and the use of may may not necessarily be dispositive of the question of whether there's a duty indeed that one that one could under the circumstances where may is abused nevertheless conclude that there was a duty but that there has to be some objective facts that trigger the transition as it were from a permissive power to a obligatory power and that is lacking in this case indeed and that but is what the would you say, but what would you say to the argument and that by its very nature the advent of COVID-19 has created a playing field where rights either are being violated or there's a real risk of rights being violated and that would be the sufficient trigger what would you say to that well, the point is firstly i would ask the court not to make an assumption that rights are violated Secondly, I'll say, assuming that that the assumption itself is enough, one will have to see precisely what legislation causes the violation in order to see whether that legislation is constitutionally impermissible, and if so, how do you redress the constitutional violation caused by that legislation? And so to conclude my point on the very fact that our Leonard friends cannot rely on the Women's Centre case, we ask you to look and compare the notice of motion in this case, as well as the declaration that was made in that case. You will find nothing in the notice of the violation based on the equality provisions of Section 9 of the Constitution, flowing from which there was a I think Mr. Malika has become frozen. Um, that's a sign that he may have uh, lost connection. That is um, when one oh, sorry, Mr. Mr. Malika, can I, can I just... Let's just wait and see whether he comes back. You're saying um, that the use of must Mr. Salurazana. I did not yes, uh, dispose of that the question of whether there's a duty. And we were connected that one, to different that one could um, under the circumstances one by both use, but it's our generators is that there was a duty. And, uh, but that there has to be some shortly. objective facts okay. that trigger the transition, as it were, from a permissive power Mr. Malaka, to how you a back? obligatory power. And that Indeed. is lacking in this case. Indeed. And that is the this load shedding business is real, no? And that by its very nature, <laughs> the advent of COVID-19 well, I never has take created a, a getting playing the field where I think it's really right. either are being Judge President, I believe now I have switched on from the Estrom supply lines to our local generator what supply what lines. That's fine. We can't hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. You can continue uh, in the hope that we will see you at some stage. Assumption is yeah, um, that um, visually and audibly uh, displayed on your screen. Thank you. In order to see so, Judge Colopin, to finalize our submissions in that regard, we ask so, you to consider the terms of the notice of motion in this case. You will find nothing in so the notice of motion in this case, which expressly identifies and seek a declaration of a violation of a specific constitutional right on the evidence in this case, so that there is simply an assumption of fact we would ask the court not to make, unlike the applicant. The second introductory remark that I'd like to make is this. I think Mr. Malika has become that the uh, Disaster Management Act he may have, uh, was promulgated connection. and came into force on 1 July 2004. To the best of our knowledge, it has been amended once in 2015 as a result of the Disaster Management Amendment Act 16 of 2015. We draw your attention to this legislation. 
simply to make the point that it is a product of legislation promulgated by our democratic legislative lawmaking body at national level in order to deal with disasters of all kind. And for that reason, I would draw your attention to several definitions of the act, because they go to the heart of uh, Leonard Friend's suggestion that there needs to be an additional legislation, because this legislation is really a temporary machinery. The first aspect of the definition section that we would like to bring to your attention is the definition of disaster. It says it's a progressive or sudden widespread or localized natural or human cost of human cost occurrence which causes or threatens to cause death injury, disease, damage to property, infrastructure or environment, or significant disruption of the life of a community. The second definition, which I will not read but ask you to know, is the definition of disaster management. Because it makes it quite clear that when a disaster as defined occurs, the state's duty to respond in this case is through a disaster management scheme. And that scheme has to have several components, one of which is that it has to be continuous, one of which is also must be integrated in a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary process requiring planning and implementation through different forms of measures. The last part of the definition I'd like to draw your attention to is response in relation to disaster. Means measures taken during or immediately after a disaster in order to bring relief to the people and communities affected by disaster. I've drawn your attention to this definition because the premise of the applicant's case is to accept that the pandemic caused by COVID-19 is a form of disaster contemplated in this act. Let me repeat what I've said. Our learned friends accept that COVID-19 or the coronavirus is a form of disaster contemplated in this act. For that reason, they must be driven to accept that the state is entitled to respond to COVID through the implementation of the measures provided for in this act. We make that point because it seems clear to us when one looks at the heads of the applicant that it is quite clear that the Disaster Management Act must apply as a state's response to the pandemic. I ask you in this regard to note what they say in paragraphs 10, 11, and 13 of their heads. And I will emphasize for the present purposes what we describe as the concession they make in paragraph 13 of their heads. Of their heads. And they say this case is also not about the oversight that Parliament has exercised over the legislature. We would submit that the reference to the legislature here ought to have been a reference to the national executive. 
and we would invite our learned friends in reply to confirm that that is how that paragraph should be read. We say so because when you look at paragraphs 13.1 and 13.2, our learned friends accept that the body of evidence which the speaker has presented before you explaining how parliament has exercised oversight on the national executive through the subcommittees of the national parliament he is not placed in issue by the applicant their response is that that body of evidence is irrelevant for the purposes of their submission we simply submit that they are mistaken because one of the foundation of their attack and one of their foundation of seeking to impose a duty on parliament is to refer to those values of accountability and transparency as the means that are lacking in the disaster management act for which they want to find a duty so that we would submit that the evidence which the speaker has placed before you is not irrelevant far from it it's relevant in order to show the promotion of those constitutional values of transparency, accountability, and all the like. Now, Mr. Post Mr. Waleka, I, I, I um, see the distinction you're making, but as I understand the applicant's case, the values of openness, transparency, and accountability are not relied upon by them in terms of Parliament's oversight role but rather how those values fit into the lawmaking process yes. and the Parliament's legislative role. So that's where they invoke those values. Yes. And so on that premise, Justice Colopin, one would have to readily assume that the Disaster Management Act, it's a product of legislation promulgated by Parliament, pursuant to compliance with its obligation under Section 59 they cannot run away from that assumption because they don't attack the Disaster Management Act so that it will have to be clear to all consent that Parliament passed this legislation complying with its all constitutional obligation because they don't attack it. And on that premise, we would submit that there can never be another argument to rely on the very same obligation to seek promulgation of another legislation when Parliament has already complied with that obligation. Secondly, the definition of disaster makes it quite clear, Justice Colopin, that it's something that it is unpredictable. It is something that requires control in different forms. It is something that requires continuous monitoring. And it is something that would require a termination of state intervention once the disaster has come and gone. I ask you in that regard to consider the provisions of section 27.5 of the act. Because with the greatest respect to our learned friends, those provisions go a long way to ask and answer the concern that they have. If you look at section 25, 20, sorry, 27 subsection 5, it says in paragraph A, a national state of disaster that has been declared in terms of subsection 1, lapses three months after it has been declared. And then paragraph B provides for the termination by notice before it lapses in terms of paragraph A. And then paragraph C provides for a month to month extension. We would submit that when our learned friends say to the court that the Disaster Management Act is no more than a stopgap measure which provides for legitimate intervention for a short-term period so that in due course the state must promulgate a case-specific legislation to deal with COVID. They fundamentally ignore the provision of section 
2075. We now know this case that there is little that is known about this pandemic. And for that reason, the state is entitled to respond not only by declaring the state of national disaster, but continually extend that state of disaster from time to time for as long as it's necessary. Because our learned friends do not challenge the need for, the promo for intervention under this act, their complaint is that the state of disaster cannot continue forever under this legislation. Their complaint is that must be directed to the time period and the regulation of the state of disaster under section 27.5. Because it is conceivable and permissible under section 27.5 for the state of disaster to continue on a month to month basis for long as it's necessary. We ask rhetorically this simple question. How on our Lenin's, our Lenin's friends approach to the legislation they contemplate exists side by side with the application of the DMA, which lawfully continues to exist on a month to month basis in terms of this section 27.5. And the two we would submit cannot go hand in hand. The very fact that section 27.5c allows for the extension of the state of disaster on a month to month basis shows that there is no need for the kind of the legislation our learned friends contend for until they challenge the legislation itself and they have not done so. So that we would respectfully submit that the time regulation period provided for in section 27.5 puts an end to the type of legislation contended for by Leonard Friends on the basis that this act is a time, it's a short term measure. The difficulty, of course, with the proposition of our Leonard Friend is it doesn't rise up to the specificity of telling us when on their own contemplation is a short term period begins and ends. We have that difficulty. We are unable to engage with that proposition on its merits or lack of merits, because the applicant does not tell us when is it constitutionally permissible for a short term measure to begin and end. On this legislation, at best for them, a short term period may be the first period declared under section 27.5a, but the extension from time to time cannot be a short term measure because we know that a month-to-month -month extension will continue to last for as long as it's necessary. And so we will submit the, the very foundation of their attack or the creation of a duty fails. I'd like to underscore the point we make in that regard by inviting the court to consider several aspects of the DMA which we submit are not only an appropriate response to a state of disaster, but also reflects that the difficulty of our learned friend's general proposition that there has to be another law. And Justice Colopin, it takes me to the very first issue you engage our learned friends on, because the applicant seeks promulgation of a case specific legislation in response to COVID-19. But they don't tell you how that legislation would look like in order to address the perceived problems they complain about without identifying specifically. The response of our learned friend we submit has not risen up to the challenge to deal with the very problem you raised about what sort of legislation do they have in mind? How would that legislation be different to the disaster management aid? What will be the constitutive elements that would meet the constitutional yardstick of the problem they have identified? There is nothing to guide this court. There's nothing to inform the speaker. 
so that we will contemplating uh, legislation in the air on their version, assuming Parliament takes them seriously and promulgates that legislation. We're now going back to the days of Janista 1 and Janista 2 in order to deal with a legislation about whether or not it sufficiently provides for the types of constitutional problems perceived by the applicant. And that's a difficulty we have. But in the light of that difficulty, Justice Colopin, I'd like to draw your attention to the provisions of Section 27 of DFA, because they do provide for intervention in a manner that caters for all the constitutional values in Section 1 of the Constitution. Transparency, accountability, and multi-party democracy. The first is that <laughs> Section 27, 1, requires for a declaration of disaster by issuing a public notice in the Gazette. It does so in a manner that is accountable because it requires the minister to make a declaration publicly known to the country so that it's not enough for the minister to wake up one morning and choose that a state of disaster exists. She has to declare a state of disaster by informing the public so that whoever has a problem with that declaration will be entitled to consider whether that declaration meet the yardstick of the act or meet the constitutional standards. So that we would submit that from the starting point, the declaration of disaster in terms of section 27.1 is a constitutional response by parliament in order to ensure that the minister acts publicly and accountably. The second is that the legislation allows the minister to intervene after the declaration of the state of disaster through promulgation of regulations of all kind. You will see that section 27, subsection 2, provides in its preamble that the minister of COCTA may provide, may promulgate regulations on matters specifically identified in subparagraphs A to O. Again, in that context, has circumscribed the delegated lawmaking powers to the minister. It is a delegation that is consistent with the constitutional principle of delegation flowing from the judgment of the Constitutional Court in Muhammad. What we submit in this regard is that our learned friends do not challenge this form of delegation. It follows, therefore, the Parliament, when it promulgated this legislation, acted constitutionally permissibly by conferring upon the minister the power to make regulations. There is another reason why Parliament has acted in a constitutionally permissible way in conferring upon the minister the power to make regulations. Because a disaster such as a disaster flowing from COVID-19 is not a matter that is static. It evolves from time to time. It requires immediate and varying interventions at different time. We know that lawmaking by parliament takes time. We know that regulation as lawmaking tools are expedient and swift to respond to the manifestation of disaster in all its varying aspects. And we would submit that for that reason, 
Parliament acted permissibly and in a constitutionally justifiable way by delegating its powers to the executive to respond here and then when circumstances so require. The other important aspect of the delegation, which again is not challenged, is that the minister herself is given powers to authorize other members of the executive to issue directions in order to respond to the state of disaster. You will find that ministerial powers to authorize the issuance of direction to her colleagues in cabinet in section 27.2. And again, that power of the minister to issue, to authorize her colleagues to issue the direction deals with matters identified in subparagraph A to O. I have drawn your attention to all of these things simply to make the point that we now know that any disruption of life which flows from the introduction of COVID-19 and its manifestation in this case does not in itself bring about the violation of any constitutional right. It is conceivably the state's response to the introduction and manifestation of COVID-19 that may bring about a possible violation of constitutional rights. And when that happens, the question is what right has been violated and how has it been violated and whether the state can justify the violation. It is precisely that all persons who conceived that their rights have been violated have time and again approached this court without knowing the facts. I can confidently suggest that all of the members of this bench now have had to confront one or other constitutional challenge based on the alleged violation of fundamental rights by the state's intervention through either regulations or directive issued under this end. And we would submit that that is where the case of the applicant, if any, should lie. Because they cannot assume a violation of right. They have to show a violation of the right. And that violation would flow from the state's response to the disaster in terms of this legislation. We would therefore submit that the case of the applicant assumes what other cases have dealt with. This takes me to the Janista case, upon which our learned friends appear to have placed some heavy reliance. The Janista case is instructive, and we commend it as a guiding post for the court to resolve this case. Because we recall that in Janista too, what had happened is that there already existed a corruption fight unit which was located within the National Prosecution Authority. As a result of what was identified in the judgment as a Polokwane conference resolution, that corruption fighting unit was sought to be disbanded by the promulgation of the South African Police Service Amendment Act, which sought to abolish then the Scorpion and seek to introduce a new corruption fighting mechanism located in the South African Police Service. Mr. Janister, like any other responsible citizen concerned with the efficacy and efficiency of fighting corruption, brought an application to challenge the Amendment Act. And the Constitutional Court held that the Amendment Act falls 
or fell short of the constitutional requirement to protect, promote, and advance the Bill of Rights in terms of Section 72 because it abolished an efficient and effective body to fight corruption by replacing it with another body which was not sufficiently independent and therefore had no guarantees of efficiency. So the attack in that case was to a specific legislation. And so if Glenister applies, as our learned friends suggest, we would submit that their problem is they did not attack as they should have the Disaster Management Act. The Constitutional Court did not, by declaring the Amendment Act to be invalid, suggest that there had to be a case-specific corruption-fighting legislation. In fact, flowing from its judgment, there was an amendment to the SUPS Act which met the conditional requirements of invalidity identified by the Constitutional Court. And we would submit that for that reason, our little friends sought to introduce an obligation on Parliament which was not even contemplated in the Dennis case. Sorry, Second. Mr. Malek. Mr. Maleka, are you really saying that if one invokes Glenister, then at least there is a basis to compare uh, what is in place and what should be in place. Indeed. Whereas in this case, we have what is in place, yes. but we don't have a sense of what should be in place. Indeed. So the foundational basis for the comparison falls away, and therefore the duty contended for can't be sustainable either. Indeed. And Justice Colopen, it goes back to the very point that you raised with our learned friends. May I round up that point by trying to link it with the submissions we have already made in our, in our heads? It is this, that when you look at the notice of motion, especially the, man, the, the mandamu sought by our learned friends in, sorry, by the applicant in paragraph three of the notice of motion. They ask parliament to initiate and they ask the executive to initiate legislation to bring about a case-specific COVID-19 legislation. What our learned friends do not accept or ignore is the very fact that lawmaking processes are a product of a democratic deliberation and decision-making by way of a vote. It does not follow that every legislation initiated by a parliament will be ultimately promulgated. It is democratically acceptable that that legislation may not be passed as a result of a vote in parliament. Because the democratic process, process in parliament requires decision by a majority and in some instances by a supermajority. So how on their own approach do they square up the obligation they contend for with the multi-democratic right of members of parliament to vote for or against the legislation? It is precisely for that reason that until they come and address your concern by identifying a specific legislation, would then an obligation arise? In this case, we have nothing. And we have nothing in the light of or in the presence of legislation that exists, which on the applicant's version deals with the pandemic. The last point that I'd like to address, or the second last point I'd like to address, relates to an interpretational device adopted by Alain Friends to suggest that the Disaster Management Act is not inclusive legislation that deals with disaster. And on their interpretational exercise, there is room for an obligation to pass another, another legislation to deal with COVID-19 pandemic. You would recall that in that regard, they rely on Section 2 of the Disaster Management Act. And Our learned friends invited you to interpret that section in a way that would 
create that duty on the basis that Section 72 of the Constitution would apply. I'd ask the court to look at that section quite carefully. I believe that it is not in the case line references, but I can read it out for the benefit of the court. Section 2.1 says that this act does not apply to any occurrence falling within the definition of disaster in Section 1. If A, sorry, A, if, and from the date on which the state of emergency is declared to deal with the occurrence in terms of the state of emergency act, or B, to the extent that that occurrence can be dealt with effectively in terms of other national legislation, Roman one, aimed at reducing the risk and addressing the consequences of occurrence of that nature, and Roman B, identified by the minister by notice in the Gazette. Our learned friends are correct, of course, when they say that Section 2 makes it quite clear that the Disaster Management Act does not apply to all forms of disaster. But they do not adequately address the exclusions provided for in Section 2, because on our own interpretation, the exclusion do not create an obligation to pass another legislation. We know now that the exclusion in paragraph A does not apply because it deals with the state of emergency. I'd like now to address the exclusion provided for in subparagraph B. It says that exclusion will apply to the extent that the disaster can be dealt with effectively in terms of another national legislation. There are two points that we would like to draw your attention to is that there has to be another national legislation. We submit that it is le the legislation which is existing, not a contemplated legislation. Secondly, the existing legislation has to effectively deal with the state of disaster so that the test is one of existence and effectiveness. We heard a lot about our learned friend's proposition and general submissions that the Disaster Management Act does not effectively deal with the COVID-19 legislation. But there is no evidence to show what are the problems of efficiency and effectiveness that are lacking in the Disaster Management Act. It is not enough to make a mere general complaint of lack of effectiveness. We have just, looked at... Uh, sorry, can, can I just clarify something? This... The, you, 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 you're submitting that B, when it says, can be dealt with effective in terms of other national legislation, the focus should be on what exists. That's what you're submitting. Mm -hmm. Why should it exclude what doesn't exist? Because there's that possibility. Because you don't know what the other legislation which does not exist effectively or does not deal effectively with the state of disaster. Yeah. Because remember, other legislation here is linked to the test of effectiveness. You cannot apply the test of effectiveness to the legislation that you don't know. And effectiveness here, Judge Mulambo, is a test based on a matter of fact. So in relation to the argument on the Women's Legal Center case, the focus there was the Marriages Act. Mm -hmm. And that's your point, that there was something that exists, but it didn't deal with Muslim marriages. Therefore, yes. th that's your argument. Indeed. Indeed. As well as in the in the Glenister case. Indeed. Indeed. It was a case specific designed and regulated and debated along the specific facts of complaints based on the evidence. There's nothing here by way of evidence to assist the court. And when we say paragraph B does not help the applicant to trigger the obligation, 
we ask you to consider what the wording of paragraph B says. It deals with and imposes the test of effectiveness with reference to other national legislation. Within the time available, Justice Mlambo, we look sorry, at... Mr. <coughs> sorry, Mr. Mareka. <coughs> I just want to, <coughs> sorry, also understand the point clearly. <coughs> 2B provides for a carve-out, not so. Yes. That, that this act wouldn't apply. But for a carve-out to exist, you're saying there must be some other legislative basis to move the management of this disaster to justify a carve-out. When yes. there isn't, there can't be a carve-out. Yes, indeed. Okay. And I say so because when you look at the test of effectiveness invoked in paragraph B, it is not effectiveness in the air. You will see that Justice Mlambo, it goes on to tell us what are the constitutive or ingredient elements of effectiveness. It says in Roman A, that effectiveness must be aimed at reducing the risk and addressing the consequences of occurrences of that nature, in other words, of the disaster itself that has been carved out. And secondly, it says B, and identified by the minister in the notice. So these are the fundamental precondition, preconditions of the cover-out. Our learned friends cannot rely on this cover-out because this cover-out says you cover out not in the air, you cover out by complying with what we call the statutory preconditions. Those are the jurisdictional facts. On the approach of our learned friends, when they invoke section two, they do so in the air. They don't do so by making sure that the car about meets the preconditions statutorily prescribed in paragraph B. So they, for that argument to, to, to be sustained by the applicants, they've got, they are constrained to challenge the DMA and say it does not meet what should be done to deal with this disaster. Is that what you say? Indeed, indeed. And they have to challenge these statutory conditions because on their version, Parliament, and assuming they successfully persuade this court that the obligation exists for Parliament to promulgate the case-specific COVID-related legislation. Yeah. Assuming that happens, it does not follow that that legislation would apply with reference to Section 2. The minister still has to say that legislation on COVID does not, can effectively deal with the disaster. And I pass the, I identify that legislation in terms of the notice in the Gazette. We submit that there's a reason why Parliament has sought to exclude the application of the Disaster Management Act to other disasters that can be effectively dealt with in other legislation by requiring the minister to promulgate the Gazette in order to give effect to that cover. It is because of the fact that the minister has to be satisfied that other legislation will effectively deal with the disaster concerned. And it will be open to those who believe that the minister would have acted unconstitutionally when he or she carves out to bring about the application of other legislation. What I wanted to do, Judge, Judge President, is to give you some examples of existing national legislation that we managed to pick up. That I think would you go there. I think what Mr. Duplessis argued is to buttress his point that you need separate and specific legislation is borne out by the fact that a myriad number of regulations have had to be issued under the DMA to deal with COVID. That, that in his argument, shows that that's the terrain that Parliament should have occupied to come with separate legislation to deal with this. That was the argument you had, it, isn't it? I had the argument. Yes. What 
then on his approach, it means that when you promulgate the act to deal with those topics, then the disaster management act would not apply. We would perceive that that interpretation of the act is unworkable because a disaster by its definition is something that mutates from time to time on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. And for that reason, you require a swift response by way of regulations and directions. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong. Um, understanding the, the first respondent's case is that a reading or a comprehensive reading of the DMA uh, as a wall-to-wall -wall response by Parliament demonstrates that the constitutional goods that Mr. Duplessis speaks about have been respected, but not only that, but also that when one looks at the structures that are established through the DMA, such as the disaster man management centers nationally across the country, yes. and the rehabilitative actions yes. that the DMA provide for mm. um, to cover whatever collateral damage may have happened mm. during the existence of COVID, COVID demonstrates that the DMA covers the current and even the post-pandemic period and that therefore this wall-to-wall -wall suggestion and also the fact that the body of evidence that you referred to uh, demonstrating Parliament's hands-on approach through its committees yes. demonstrate that uh, the Parliament has not abdicated its duties. Yes. Is that a fair understanding or is there anything that, that you want to correct? Not at all. I think, Justice Butler, you have summarized it much more perfectly than we have attempted to. What we can only, what we can do is simply to add other provisions of the Disaster Management Act, which again, cover the scheme of the wall to wall. For instance, section four of the Disaster Management Act, which provide for intergovernmental committee on management of disaster. Again, section five of the DMA, which provides for a representative advisory forum of all interested parties to come and assist the state in the implementation of the disaster. Because this legislation does not pretend that the state knows it all. It requires every other element of participatory interested parties to assist Parliament to deal, to, sort of, to assist the executive to deal with the disaster. It is one of the most forward-looking and representative legislation that one can get. And we wonder what else our learned friends want in the legislation they think of, which is not covered in the Disaster Management Act, other than the suggestion that it is Parliament who has to pass another legislation. What will Parliament say in that other legislation? So that we would submit that you're correct, Justice Bakwa, when you say that there is a wall-to-wall -wall regulation of a response to disaster in this legislation. Justice Mlambo, if it's convenient to, I'd like to give you some examples of legislation which we believe are contemplated in section 2.1.B of the Disaster Management Act. We, we, do, we, we, we do so without pretending that these are the only legislative provisions, there may be more. But the first one that we have identified is the mar Marine Pollution Intervention Act, number, four, number 64 of 1987. It has been amended several times. I accept that that legislation was promulgated before the Disaster Management Act. But it is the very fact that when the Disaster Management Act was promulgated, that it took cognizance of this legislation as a pre-existing legislation. 
that regulates a response to marine pollution and the intervention required to deal with that pollution. The next legislation that we have identified is the National Feld VELD and Forest Fire Act 101 of 1998. It too pre-existed the Disaster Management Act because it came into effect on 1 April 1999 but it was nevertheless amended on several occasions, including an amendment which came into effect after the disaster management came into effect. And that is the amendment provided for in the Forestry Laws Amendment Act 35 of 2005. The next legislation we have identified Oh, by the way, the, the Forestry Act deals with the disaster caused by forest fires. The next legislation we've identified is the National Environmental Management Act, Air Quality Act 39 of 2004. This legislation was promulgated and came into effect on the 11th of September 2005. And it therefore came into force after the Disaster Management Act came into operation. But its preeminent obligation is to regulate control of air pollution and provide for state intervention. Of course, there is a general legislation relating to the National Environmental Management Act. And that provides for duties of those who pollute our environment to deal with the pollution they cause. And therefore, we will submit that when one looks at Section 2, 1A uh, and B, one must interpret in the light of those legislation and others in order to see whether or not the states can deal with a disaster in terms of those other legislation. But those, the interpretation contended for by Leonard Friend is certainly does not arise and does not create the type of duty they contend for. Finally, Judge Mambo, I would like to deal with the question of costs. You know that in our heads, we have asked that in the event this application fails, you should order the applicant to pay costs. We would submit that this is an appropriate case where you should order the applicant to pay costs. Because the applicant has engaged in litigation which was not designed and is not helpful to this court, not even to the speaker, because it's a general litigation which is not founded upon clear evidence of a violation of a set of constitutional rights. It is just a general assumption made by the applicant. Secondly, it is an application which is broad, inconsistent with the very case law that our learned friends have pointed to this court without explaining why they do not seek to challenge the existing legislation. It's a type of irresponsible litigation we would ask this court to discourage Lastly, you know that this, this litigation has a history of its own. It started in the Constitutional Court, again by Wolf Agency. The Constitutional Court refused to certify the hearing of this matter. The applicant has now brought this application in this court. 
again on the grounds of agency. We have taken the point of lack of agency. I'm not going to repeat what our heads have dealt with in that regard. Merely make the point that it is unfortunate that at every turn, the applicant would persist with an engagement of this case on an agent basis when there is no case for agency and when it is still unfair to us what is the true nature of the constitutional complaint. We complete our submissions on cost on this basis that all of you have sought to understand from the applicant precisely what is their case. For our part, we remain unclear what their case is, notwithstanding the fact that they have completed their arguments on their case. And for those reasons, we would submit that this is an appropriate case where you should consider the grant of costs. Of course, we would submit that the costs consequent upon the engagement of two consul will be justified in this case. Those would be our submissions, just Justice Mlambo, and I hope that they are well within the period of 45 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Maleka. Um, I'm happy with you and not one of your other colleagues who would have given themselves more time, but uh, it is more than 45 minutes, but it was necessary, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to request Advocate Morane to kick off. Because we took our tea adjournment at 11.30, we will adjourn for lunch at 1.30. I think it's it's more than reasonable to do things that way. Thank you, thank you, Advocate Malika. Mr. Morane, are you ready? Uh, as the court pleases. <clears throat> Uh, but Lord, it's, 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 it's always difficult coming at the end uh, uh, to uh, argue uh, a matter which has already been, to a certain extent, thoroughly debated and, 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 and pressed out. I sh shall, for that reason, be very brief. Uh, at the outset, uh, I adopt all the submissions that have been made by, by my learned colleague uh, Malega uh, on, on the law uh, and on the, the question as, as to whether or not the applicants have made out a case. Uh, on the grounds in which they uh, have sought to, to make out a case. <clears throat> the, the singular question before the court is, is whether there is an obligation on the executive to prepare and initiate legislation that deals specifically with, with COVID-19. <clears throat> that is as far as, as, as concerns the second third and, and fifth respondents. Uh, applicant argues that there is such an obligation for two reasons which we submit are misplaced. The first source of the, oblig of the obligation, according to the applicant, is Section 7, Subsection 2 of the Constitution, which requires the state to respect, protect, and promote the rights in the Bill of Rights. The second submission that they make is that <clears throat> to be constitutionally compliant, the Disaster Management Act, I shall refer to this as the Act <clears throat> in future, must be read as a temporary or stopgap response to disasters. A, a corollary of this basis is that the long-term solution is for the legislature to adopt legislation that deals specifically with a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our main submission on, on the first issue is that there is no such obligation and the applicant misrepresents uh, the obligation in terms of section seven, subsection two. In particular, uh, 
the applicant does not identify, that is apart from just categorizing rights, does not identify the, the rights uh, that have not been uh, respected or protected or promoted uh, by the acts, by the, the statute and by the acts of the executive. They do not. And we submit that in order for them uh, to uh, move from first base as far wow. as an alleged uh, violation of section seven, subsection two is concerned, they have to identify uh, the, the rights that have not been promoted or respected. It's not enough in our submission to say that several constitutional rights are impacted uh, or are limited by the act and, and by uh, the regulations and directions issued uh, thereunder. For that to ground a, 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 a case of constitutional violation, there must be an allegation, at least, that there has been a violation of particular rights. In other words, an unjustifiable violation of the rights. I mean, we, we readily uh, uh, concede that rights are limited uh, under the acts and under the regulations and under the directions that have been issued. But our submission is that those limitations are justifiable. And the applicants do not take issue with that. Uh, oh, I, I, I thought uh, Justice Colopin wanted to, uh, as, as, as court pleases. <clears throat> what you yes. want as far as the way, you know, they say, <laughs> let's let the dog fly. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, then on, 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 on their second uh, submission uh, that the, the act must be read as a temporary stopgap measure, we submit that is to strain uh, the text and the scheme of the act. Uh, I shall not go into the various respects in which this is done. We've, we've, we've elaborated on this in, in our heads. And uh, our colleague, Mr. Maleka, has also elaborated on that. Now, <clears throat> with, with regard to the obligations of the executive, uh, it's common cause that executive authority of the Republic is located in section 85 of the Constitution. And that section 85, subsection 1, vests the executive authority of the Republic in the, pres in the president. And in terms of section 85, 2, the president exercises that authority together with the cabinet. And the president and the cabinet exercise this authority uh, by performing any one or more of the executive functions which are listed in section 85 2a to e in other words uh, section 85 gives the executive five options by means of by means of which they exercise such authority and we submit that there is nothing in the wording of section 85 that indicates firstly that the, all the options must be exercised at the same time and we submit that as a response to COVID-19 and other uh, uh, disasters, the executive relied on section 85-2A and E and elected to implement the act. And the act we submit is the national legislation through which the state responds to disasters. 
we readily concede that in certain circumstances, the executive might be required to, to act in terms of Section 85.2D. In other words, there might be instances where it would be most appropriate for the executive to prepare and initiate legislation. Uh, but we, we say those circumstances have not risen in this case. Uh, Justice Barkwa has referred to certain provisions of the uh, Constitution which mandate the enactment of legislation, such as Section 9, Subsection 4 of the Constitution, 25, Sub 5, 26, Sub 2, 27, Sub 2, 32, Sub 2, and 33, Sub 3. Um, but in any event, the only basis uh, on which the applicants submit that the executive has an obligation to prepare uh, and initiate legislation dealing with COVID-19 is Section 7, Subsection 2. And at the core of their submission, the, the applicants contend that COVID-19 has an impact on virtually every right in our Bill of Rights. And the rights in the Bill of Rights continue to be threatened by the, the regulations that the executive adopts under the Act. That is the high watermark of their case. But as I've already submitted, my lords, uh, that on its own doesn't found a basis for an obligation. Uh, to enact legislation. There must, as we have submitted, be an allegation that in fact, the executive has contravened that provision by not having regard to specific rights in the constitution. And this we submit they have failed to do. Um, And secondly, as far as the, the, the provisions of the Act are concerned, uh, or, or as far as the provisions, as far as the regulations are concerned, uh, the applicants do not identify and challenge any offensive regulations or directions on the basis that they do not pass the justification test in, in, in Section 36. Now, the, the, the third problem which the applicant has in our submission is that Section 7, Subsection 2 of the Constitution does not prescribe how those rights are to be protected, promoted, and fulfilled. The, the methods and the mode whereby this is done is appropriately left to the executive. Uh, and to sum up our submission on on this point, uh, we submit that the, the, the case of the applicant is, is flawed because, one, it does not challenge the val constitutional validity of the Act. And secondly, it does not directly or in a frontal manner challenge the adequacy of the Act as the legislation through which the state responds to and deals with disasters such as uh, COVID-19. In fact, on the contrary, it actually accepts, that the applicant accepts that the Disaster Management Act is a coherent and adequate vehicle for its purpose. And this is to be found at paragraph 11 sub 2, 11.2 of their heads. And also uh, at 12.6 of their heads, they, they state that their attack does not suggest that there are, there are constitutional deficiencies with the act. And thirdly, the applicants do not challenge the rationality of the executive's choices 
to invoke and place reliance on the act in giving effect uh, to the mandate in, in section seven, subsection two. Now we, 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 we submit the Lords that these are significant because they, they, they show that the mode of giving effect to the mandate uh, in section seven, two of the constitution is not what the applicant would have preferred. But this is not a case about the executive's failure to protect and advance the rights in the Bill of Rights as Section 7.2 requires. Rather, the applicant wishes uh, that COVID-19 uh, be dealt with under a special act, as in the United Kingdom and, and Scotland. That is really their complaint. But of course, the election in Section 85.2 is not for the applicant to make, it is for the executive to make. What one so, thing I need to correct in your submissions, Mr. Morane, I don't know if you want to respond to it, is you say Section 7.2 imposes no obligation to legislate, and you argue that point, but I'm sure you can admit uh, that um, or concede that. Mr. Duplessis showed us constitutional court authority uh, where a duty was placed on parliament to legislate based on section 7.2. I'm talking of the Metro Rail case as well as the, the Women's Legal Center case because those cases were based on that section of the constitution to say there's a legislative lacuna to deal with this issue therefore there's need for legislation but the basis of those cases was section 72 uh my lord may, maybe i did not express myself uh, elegantly yeah. we do not we do not say that section 7 subsection 2 does not impose an obligation uh to to, in, for, to, for instance, pass legislation. No, no, we, no, no. no. Our, our, our submission is that for that obligation to arise, yeah. the, the state must have failed to protect, promote, and fulfill the rights. You know. that, 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 Please, that is, presupposes uh, an, an identification of those rights. Absolutely. 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 Okay. Yes. That, 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 that is our case. That is our case. And, and for, for some reason, they, they have shied away from identifying uh, the violation of, of those rights. So we submit that their, their, their case falls flat. Um, now, <clears throat> Now, now, with regard to, to the, what I refer to as the disaster management argument, we, we submit that the applicant's claim finds no support in the act. Uh, I'm preferring now to the stopgap measure. Uh, we, we submit that the actual scheme of the act indicates the opposite of, of, of what the applicant asserts. I shall adopt everything that was said in this regard uh, by uh, my colleague Malika, and I'm not, I'm not going to repeat it, except to highlight one or two issues. Uh, we, 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 we submit that the starting point must be a proper reading of Section 2, which, which deals with the application of the Act. And we say it precludes its application to an occurrence falling within the definition of disaster, if that occurrence can be dealt with effectively in terms of other national legislation aimed at reducing the risk and addressing the consequences of occurrences of that nature. In other words, that it contemplates legislation that already exists. Uh, in section 26 of the act deals with the government's responsibilities 
uh, in the event of, of a national disaster. In terms of sub one, national executive is mandated to deal with national disasters, whether or not a national state of disaster has been declared in terms of section 27. And section 26 sub two explains how the national executive is to deal with such disaster, national disaster. It must deal with a national disaster either in terms of existing legislation and contingency arrangements if a national disaster, state of disaster has not been declared in terms of 27.1. And it has to deal in terms of the existing legislation and contingency arrangements as augmented by regulations or directions made or issued in terms of 27.2 if a national state of disaster has been declared. Section 26.2 does not contemplate the adoption of legislation if it does not already exist. That is clear from, from its language. Uh, we, we further submit that the starting point to understand the scheme of the Disaster Management Act is the Constitution. And we refer this regard to Section 41 1B, which requires all spheres of government to secure the well being of the people of the Republic. And we submit that both the Disaster Management Act, together with the National disaster management framework, which was adopted in 2005, are the centerpiece legislation that govern the state's response to disasters. And the act itself is aimed at ensuring a uniform and integrated approach to disaster management and disaster risk uh, reduction in each sphere of government and across all spheres of government involving all relevant stakeholders. Th this point we, we, we make uh, in the answering affidavit, paragraph 42, page 168. And according to the preamble to the act, the objective of the act is to provide for an integrated and coordinated disaster management policy that focuses on preventing or reducing the risk of disasters mitigating the severity of disasters, emergency preparedness, rapid and effective response to disasters, and post-disaster recovery and rehabilitation. Now, it's important also, my lords, to go to the definition of disaster management. Disaster management is defined as a continuous an integrated, multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary process of planning and implementation of measures aimed at five things, at preventing or reducing the risk of disasters, two, mitigating the severity or consequences of disasters, three, emergency preparedness, for a rapid and effective response to disasters, and five, post-disaster recovery and rehabilitation. And we, we submit that the response is, is continuous. Nothing uh, in the provision or in, in the act contemplates the cessation of the act, of the act's application uh, somewhere uh, during a disaster. It cannot be a proper interpretation. Uh, the act actually focuses on the four aspects uh, of disaster management. F firstly, it establishes an elaborate institutional framework for disaster management, including the establishment of disaster management centers across the three spheres of government. Secondly, it entrenches a detailed policy development and strategic planning, planning framework for disaster management. 
And thirdly, it provides for the classification and declaration of disasters. And lastly, it deals with the funding of post-disaster recovery and rehabilitation. I'm not going to deal with um, the guiding principles regarding the funding um, and also going that in uh, paragraph, um, I mean, uh, clause 56, section 56 of the, of, of the Act and uh, section 57 of the Act. Uh, And we generally submit that there's nothing unconstitutional about reading the act as the legislative structure governing the state's response to disasters. Now, <clears throat> as I've already submitted, uh, the, the reading of the act, particularly section two of the act by the uh, applicant leads to a strained uh, uh, interpretation, which does not accord with the text and the purpose of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, in this regard, Lord, we uh, refer to paragraph 51 of our heads and reliance uh, on, amongst others, the decision of uh, constitutional court in Moyo uh, versus Minister of Justice. Uh, uh, we, we have cited that in, in, in our heads. And section 39 of the Constitution requires legislation be read in conformity with the Bill of Rights, if that is possible. Uh, Lords, I'm not going to deal with um, the principles uh, that underlie the interpretation uh, of legislation. Uh, these have been set out in a number of decisions of the SCA and the Constitutional Court, and these are to be found in paragraph 54 of, of, our, of our heads. Um, We've already submitted that the applicant does not challenge the constitutional validity of the Act. Uh, in asserting that the Act should be interpreted narrowly, the applicant assumes, without setting out the argument, that a wider reading would render the, the Act constitutional. It would, in other words, amount to uh, an, an unlawful delegation of Power. We, we, we submit that this is not correct. Uh, to be an unlawful delegation of power, the Act must have to permit uh, the minister to exercise plenary legislative powers. And we refer in this connection to the Executive uh, Council Western Cape case uh, at paragraph 68 of our heads. We submit that the, the Act does no such thing and the applicant does not actually submit that it, it, it confers plenary legislative uh, powers on the minister. But the two sections, 27.2 and 27.3, provide sufficient guidelines for and constraints on the exercise of the minister's powers <laughs> under the Act. Uh, both sections read together make it clear that the minister's delegated powers may only be exercised to the extent that it is necessary for purposes identified in section 27.3a to e. And this we mention in paragraph 77 of, of our heads. We submit that in exercising the powers under section 27 of the act, the minister <coughs> does not usurp national, provincial, or municipal legislative powers. They make, <clears throat> minister makes binding rules authorized by law and with 
the force of law, in the fulfillment of a national legislative purpose set out in section 27. And we deal with this in section, in paragraph 69 of our heads. Whether delegation of authority is permissible or not is determined by a number of factors. These factors are not exhaustive and should be ultimately informed by the prevailing circumstances. And we deal with this uh, in, in, in paragraph uh, 70 of our heads. <clears throat> Sometimes flexibility is required to achieve the purpose. Yeah, uh, Mr. Section Mark, I, mean, yeah. I don't think you need to go deeper there because I don't think that's the applicant's case. Yes. Um, they are not arguing that at all. Yeah. But what yes. I wanted to ask you, mm. um, and it's also not the applicant's case, but it's a scenario that you faced when you argued in the FITA case, where a regulation outlawing the sale of tobacco products was challenged on the basis that uh, it, uh, well, it was violating rights uh, mm. of those who use or sell, but mm. that there was alternative legislation or there was other legislation which could effectively deal with what the executive was trying to do mm. in, the, in, te in the context of the DMA. You remember the argument that the Tobacco Control Act could have been used to deal with that. But I'm just raising this in the context that it's not the applicant's case that parts of the DMA are being challenged. They're not being challenged. But mm. that was the, 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 and I'm just trying to relate it to the argument based on section two of the DMA that there are certain aspects that can be dealt with through other legislation. You know, I don't know if you have a comment to make to that. Well, well, that 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 is so. That that is so. Certain aspects can be dealt with, and, and in our submission, they are being dealt with uh, in terms of other uh, uh, legislation. If one looks at the regulations that have been promulgated, for instance, some of them <clears throat> deal specifically with with certain statutes, refers to those statutes, and. In terms of Section 26, to augments those those statutes. In our, in other words, our, our, our submission is is that other statutes are not irrelevant, and 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 they they have to be uh, applied and enforced, and if necessary, to be augmented. Uh, but 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 as 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 Judge President, in my submission, correctly sets out that is not the case of the applicants. This is not what we are saying. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm. I'm at the end. I'm at the end of the. My, 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 just, just as you end, Mr. Morane. Uh, just a response. It seems that the fear of the applicants is ruled by ministerial edict and probably foreseeing a situation if COVID is still there, God forbid, in December 2021, where the minister of COVID is still going to be uh, issuing regulations and so on. And, and the story is the locus of power is in parliament, not in a minister. It seems that's, that's what, uh, what's your comment on that? <coughs> Um, our, our comments, uh, Justice Bagua, is that as, as long as the state of national disaster exists, as long as the, the power uh, to make regulations and issue directions still exist for the specific purpose of controlling and mitigating the effects of uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. There is nothing in principle in our submission which deprives 
the minister of exercising those powers, even up to December, if necessary. Her actions are always subject to oversight by parliament. If, for instance, uh, parliament uh, comes to the conclusion that the minister is overreaching herself, firstly, by not uh, issuing a regulation, putting an end to the uh, uh, operation of, of the DMA, or otherwise acting unlawfully uh, in, in, in any manner, uh, Parliament still has that right of overseeing and scrutinizing uh, that action. Uh, no, no, no. The, well, whoever is in control of the platform should exclude those people who are interfering with the hearing. Please go ahead, Mr. Morale. Yes. Um, the, the applicant refers to legislation that was uh, passed <laughs> recently in the United Kingdom and Scotland. But the applicant hasn't put up that legislation. If that legislation were to be put up, one would see that firstly, that legislation deals with the amendment, temporary amendment of existing legislation, which naturally would, would invoke uh, the, the powers of, of parliament. And secondly, that legislation also gives powers to the Secretary of State and various ministers to issue regulations and directions much the same way as, as, as our act does. Uh, as, as a, a legitimate uh, response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. My, my short answer, uh, Justice Bagwa, is that as long as what the minister does is authorized by statute, and as long as it's not unlawful or unconstitutional, there's no reason why it, 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 it cannot be done. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think uh, you, you said you were at your end. Are you going to argue costs now, Mr. Murani? Uh, br very briefly, very, very yeah. briefly. Uh, we, 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 we submit that uh, th this case is wholly ill-conceived and should never have been brought at all. There, there is nothing in the constitution that requires uh, the executive to prepare and initiate legislation which deals specifically with COVID-19. Uh, and the contention that section seven, subsection two provides such a requirement is not correct. And their reliance uh, on Glenister uh, is misguided. Uh, we submit that the court in Glenister left the choice of how to protect and promote the rights in the Bill of Rights to the state. And we submit that the proper reading of the act indicates that it was intended to be the avenue through which the state responds to disasters. The applicant assumes without demonstrating that a wide reading of the section would amount to unlawful delegation of powers, and of, as we submitted, that's incorrect. And their contention that the government should have followed England and passed COVID-19 legislation is absubstantiated, and in any event, uh, is without even merit. Uh, I think everybody who <laughs> reads papers, who watches television, would be aware of the fact that South Africa is actually faring much better than the United Kingdom in its response to COVID-19. Uh, if one reads, for instance, the John Hopkins daily mortality analysis, uh, one would, 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 would see that. And in any event, as I've already stated, the United Kingdom legislation uh, has essentially two parts to it. Firstly, that there's an, an amendment 
existing legislation, which requires uh, uh, the, uh, the parliament to take part in it, and in also that it it gives power uh, of making regulations and issuing directions to the Secretary of State and various ministers. Uh, the, the, the court in FITA accepted that uh, government's position that decisions of other countries have no impact on decisions about what happens in this country. Uh, that England has adopted COVID-19 specific legislation is of no moment within South, South African context. In, in South Africa, what informs decisions in government conduct is its constitutional and legislative frameworks. And for, for, for those reasons, we, we, we submit that the application should really be dismissed with the cost, including the cost of, of, of two council. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Morani. Um, you strayed into our lunch adjournment by 10 minutes. Um, to my colleagues, I, so I, I think a 30 minute adjournment would be okay, colleagues. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we're going to adjourn for exactly 30 minutes. So, we'll reconvene at 1410. That, because we are joining now at 13.40. Thank you very much. Court agents. Thank you.